I'm a man, so not to be too cliche, but I don't really care about my skin. I mean, I wash it, it's clean, but there's definitely more I could be and should be doing, which is why I was so intrigued when Curology walked into my life. Curology makes skincare effortless, even for those of us not putting a whole lot of effort into the ordeal to begin with. And if you go to Curology.com sacred, you can get a 30-day free trial of their products so you can see what Curology can do for you. All you have to do is cover a small shipping and handling fee of five bucks. So if you're ready for healthier skin and a routine that makes sense, go to Curology.com sacred to get started. Get your 30-day free trial of Curology skincare products by going to Curology.com sacred. You just cover shipping and handling. That's Curology.com sacred. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to Patreon.com slash Media. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast. This is episode 141. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined today, not by Chris Raygun, who is under the weather. We'll talk about him in a minute, but by my other handsome son, the executive producer of Last Stand Media, Dustin Furman. Dustin, thank you for joining me today. How are you? I'm, I'm doing really good today. Did you ever yeah. wake up and you actually feel motivated right off the bat? That's usually I got to like you know, like ramp up into productivity, but like I got up, cleaned the house. I uh, got a bunch of stuff ready for uh, today for the different content. So it's been a productive day. It feels good. Good. Uh, I do have those days once in a while. Not often, though. Me neither. It's, be- it's becoming in Virginia. It, today's a little nicer, but it, it was, it's pretty, pretty hot and not very hot, but like in the 70s. And it's becoming one of those things where I can't really sleep at night because I love sleeping in cold weather and I like leave windows open and stuff. And then I blast the AC during the summer, but I'm in that weird middle space. And so I'm not getting my rest. And so mm-hmm. I lack that motivation that you're currently. Uh, Mine will be gone by, soon. Grasped for sure. by, controlled by. But nonetheless, thank you for joining me now. Chris isn't here today. Chris rarely misses episodes, but uh, he's just not feeling very well. He asked if we can record a little later today and give him a little more time to rest up. But out of respect for Dustin's and Ben's schedule, I actually declined because this week's been pretty crazy with just recording things out of order. And I don't want to put more work on the boys plate. So anyway, Chris will be back next week. And I don't know... This episode is interesting because there's there's some pretty big news, but I don't know that Chris could have otherwise really missed a better episode because I feel like there's not that much apart from the one item that we really need to talk about. So, but uh, Dustin, how is life? Talk to me a little bit about what's going on in your world. Hmm. Let's see what's going on. I don't know. I feel like I'm in a weird in between space where. I mean, I hate to be everyone's talking about the pandemic all the time, but it's especially weird now because it's like one foot in normal and one foot in not. And so I think part of this and a lot of people have also mentioned this, that it's like because we've been living in our homes and not doing and going out and experiencing events, the way that we think back on life is kind of messed up right now. Like it's weird because I've achieved in this past year, I feel like professionally more than ever, which is awesome. I feel really glad about that. But I also feel like my life is like slipping by so fast. And I think it's because of, you know, the way the world is. So sure. It's, it's a weird duality, but I think, you know, I think we're, we're coming out the other end pretty good at this point. We definitely are coming, coming out of it now, which is cool. And, I was just talking about that with someone yesterday that I feel like this this specific time in history this last year will be an historic time in history, not for obvious reasons, but it's going to be one of those things where people in the future are going to ask people like you or me, like you lived through the pandemic. What was the pandemic like? It's very similar to the Depression, I would assume. People always connect it to like, you know, the Spanish flu of the late 19 teens. But and that makes sense. But in terms of like this shared experience actually joe biden talked about it in his speech last night from when we were recording this he was talking about like how we have this shared experience together and it's true like our everyone alive right now has this really 
it's rare, although unfortunate because it's so catastrophic, but it's rare that everyone in the world is dealing with literally the same thing. You can't escape unless you're living like in Siberia or something weird like that. And like, you're never going (laughs) to where what in Texas, maybe now in Texas. Yeah, too. (laughs) So I don't know. I'm interested in that. I'm interested in like the long game where how we kind of look back at this time. And also I'm interested in it's obviously really going to screw up this generation of children. And I'm really interested in the sociological study over the next few decades about which group of children are screwed up the most from this, whether it's because I was saying like there's a group of kids that like missed kindergarten or first grade. Huge thing. There are also kids that missed their senior year and in fact missed like the last half of their junior year and then their entire senior year. How does that mess them up and how does that change from the kindergartner and like where is the where is it safest to kind of have missed this time? I don't know. It's a really fascinating thing, but I think we're coming out of it. And yeah, this year just kind of this last 12 months has just sucked. But professionally, like you said, it, it, it is kind of hard because professionally for the both of us and for the company, and everything we're doing better than ever. And right. You almost feel bad about that. But I think it also speaks to people's desperation to find distraction. And it's the same reason why video game, the video game industry does better in times of um market recession like in 2008 2009 the market was booming so anyway merch yeah talking about merch you have some of the merch on we can go to last damn media or you can go to lastdamnmedia.shop for t-shirts and all that made in the usa made to order people are starting to get their orders and they're really enjoying them i really like this clean white shirt with the CLS logo on it, but you have all sorts of different logo options. Do you have anything to, to, to say about this, Dustin? So, yeah, I just got my order in and I have to say, I mean, we knew the quality was great, but it is really nice. Like, I love the fact like this shirt, you don't feel the ink on it. It just is like smooth. Don't you hate it when you get a shirt that has like a huge image on it and it feels like you can feel it weighing on you almost? Sure. Yeah. But I absolutely uh, yeah. know what you mean. Yeah. For the for the video listeners, I have the the uh sacred symbols face mask and the shirts and um yeah we got all dude i got all kinds of stuff i got the the pullover for holly which a lot of people have asked me so it's probably good that i say it on the show a lot of people are asking what's the difference between the pullover and the hoodie the pullover is like a t-shirt material that's long sleeve with a hood and the hoodie is like a much thicker like a normal hoodie right right but um man I, I told you this call the other day. I was like, I could live in this hoodie. It is so freaking comfortable. The the print on it is so good. I sound like a salesman right now. I, I know that, but I legitimately am like stoked about this merch. I mean, it was a long time coming. We've been working on this for, for months. Yeah. So yeah, so and I agree. Uh, yeah, you did a great job. The, the, w- the weight was worth it. It's hard. You know, there's some really bad merch out there. We, I, I definitely didn't want to be associated with any of that. So I think we found the right partner. People are enjoying it. Um, it is print on demand. So some people are saying like they're not getting their email, clarif- you know, verifications right away and stuff. Just be patient if you can or reach out to them on the site. We don't really have anything to do with that per se, but we're really happy with the way everything's going. And yeah, we're, we're, we're of course selling merch and we're going to make money on it. And that's great. But I will say two things. Number one is we're making much less money on it than most people do because we're, we have much higher quality clothes and we're making them in the United States. So uh, you're not getting sh- sweatshop labor from Malaysia or something like that, making your T-shirt. And the second thing is, is that the, the, the profit's nice, but not necessary for the, the functioning of the company. We really wanted to do this because people want to rep the gear. And so we wanted to give you guys the highest quality gear we could so lastdamnmedia.shop check it out i'm especially keen on the vinyl stickers of all the logos as well yeah we got right here they're really they're they're sweet i'm gonna put one on my car very soon yeah you should you please do so the only other thing i want to advertise before we get into the show in earnest is uh of course our show is supported on patreon at patreon.com slash lastdamnmedia about ten thousand of you support us there at any one time We really appreciate it. It's the only way we can do this show. You can get early ad free access to every episode of the show by supporting us over there. The ability to submit your questions, comments, concerns, thoughts and ideas to our show. And of course, exclusive access to Sacred Symbols Plus, which is only for patrons, our weekly Patreon only episode of Sacred Symbols. Uh, This, of course, goes for our Xbox podcast, Defining Duke and Defining Duke Ultimate as well. And our retro podcast, Knockback. Last week's episode of Sacred Symbols Plus was a rare uh, an exceedingly rare solo Colin episode. People really enjoyed that. I just did a Q&A for about an hour and a half next week. 
And we'll talk about this news here on the show, of course. I'm going to get Maddie, Mr. Maddie Plays, onto the show, who, of course, does Defining Duke, our Xbox podcast. We're going to talk for the first time on this show, uh, which will be really fun. And we're going to talk all about the Bethesda deal, specifically about how it affects Sony from a far deeper, granular angle, which we won't get on the show, get to on this show, but we will get into on that show nonetheless. All right. Corey Brown wrote into us, said, hey, guys, Colin, I just wanted to let you know. That Hybroxia 2 on PS4 was platinum number 148 for me. The Vita version was in line to be 149, but considering you were one of the main catalysts for my trophy trophy obsession, I decided it deserved the milestone 150 slot. So I queued up the last campfire, cranked through that platinum, then went back to destroy the final boss, Odin, for 150. The kicker, the trophy popped on 311 day. Great job of the game, great job of the podcast, great job staying true to yourselves and your shared mission. Thank you, Corey. Appreciate that so much. I love trophy milestones. I'll have you know that... um, I think Twin Breakers physical Vita version was my hundredth platinum oh. trophy. And I already have eight this year. I'm up to 116 already this year in platinums. Talk about that in a minute. Somebody shared with me yeah. another a trophy milestone in our I think it was in our Discord. I can't remember the name. I'm sorry, but they had, I believe, 69 trophies and their score was 420. I saw and that. Yeah, that was that's just uh, that's, impressive. That's very cool. I mean, so, it's not cool, but it's very coincident. It's very coincidental. Yeah, that, that happened. No, I appreciated that for sure. All right. What else here before we get into the things we're playing? Oh, March 18th, there is a Square Enix showcase. Kind of like a Nintendo style showcase. They promise that they're going to talk more about the future of life is strange. They'll have more about Outriders, which has been a huge hit for them from people can fly, I think. Right. Is that people can fly? Yes. Yeah. Outriders. Uh, Bale in Wonderland, which I know people are interested. There's more Tomb Raider news, although I think that's already leaked. And then the Avengers is going to be talked about more as well. Kale Ing wrote into us on Patreon and he says, what do you guys think of the upcoming Square Enix, not Nintendo Direct? Any announcements you're excited for or hope to see? I'm interested in whatever Tomb Raider and Final Fantasy news that comes out of it. Thanks and keep consecrating those symbols. Thank you, Kale. I think the Tomb Raider news is the news that had leaked last last week or so that they're just re-releasing the the three Tomb Raider games in some sort of the new ones, the crystal games in some sort of collection. I don't expect too much out of this at all. I'm wondering if you have any expectations. No, keep your expectations for any future streaming event extremely low. I mean, we we've been through this over and over since really since COVID started and more and more companies are doing these streams that they're usually more low key, though. I, I do have to say, Colin, that Life is Strange for me is like Kingdom Hearts to you. Like, I, I, we've had enough. Enough Life is Strange. We don't need it anymore. Yeah, I don't, I don't begrudge their success. I think it's really cool that they found yeah. a way over there, especially because they were really going to die without Life is Strange, and they found a good, a good partner and all of that. But yeah, it, it's, I'm not really much of an adventure gamer. I, I'm not really looking for that kind of stuff. Although I, I heard that the game is quite charming. It's, it's certainly not something I'm opposed to playing, but. Right. I'm so far behind now that I don't even know because there's like the two Life is Strange seasons and there's like two interstitials, right? And all that. I'm like, I'm not going to play this. So, right. yeah, I always <laughs> Carrick and I have a long running thing that he absolutely loves Life is Strange. And I've I have tried and I I simply do not get it. So I, I'm, I'm joking. No disrespect to anyone who loves Life is Strange. I just simply I don't get it. It's probably because I like Kingdom Hearts. So it's like my brain is just too uh, I don't know too far gone yeah, <laughs> to well, at this point yeah it's definitely too far gone i would say uh just a couple more pieces of news that we need to get through nothing that i want to talk about it in depth but just to kind of keep people abreast of the situation apprised of the situation we've been talking for a while about uh, troy Levitt at um or levitt i'm not really sure how to say his name at avalanche software the guy who kind of was outed by the tattletale journalists like liam robertson and ian walker um And we were talking about how he really did nothing wrong and no one can still identify anything that he actually did wrong. But nonetheless, he announced that he has quit Avalanche. I'm skeptical about all of this. I've reached out to him and have talked to him a little bit behind the scenes, but nothing worth sharing, nothing that I can share. And also he wants to kind of, I think, tell his own story on his own YouTube channel. But I keep wanting to have him on the show when the time comes to talk about his experience. My theory about this is he quit because it was... I'm not so sure that like they asked him to quit. I don't know that that's the case. Maybe we'll find out that that is the case, but I think he might have done the right thing because realizing that the game is now going to be unfairly marked with these questions 
when they just want to promote it. So like when they go to a new if there's like a new event or something or they show new parts of the game, the, the questions are going to be about Troy and not the game. And so getting rid of him in some way or losing him from the team is an unfortunate reality that probably strengthens their team and makes them more focused. But I was really sorry to hear that. Do you have any feelings about about him leaving? Yeah, I'm just really curious to see. He said that he's going to release his own video. As you mentioned, he wants to tell his own story. And so I think that it's it's wise of both of us. And you've already kind of said this, that we kind of wait to see what his perspective is before we, you know, damn uh, Warner Brothers or w- WB Games or whatever, just because there's clearly a lot behind the scenes. Yeah, I I think so, too. I I wouldn't be surprised if it was some sort of mutual thing. Nice payout. NDA signed, no immediate security worries. Maybe he gets a year of pay or something like that. But I was sad to see it because I, I thought for a moment that we were going to serve we as like a people that like normal uh, conduct in business would would have been like, oh, WB is not going to bust balls about this and they're just going to keep going. But that ended up not happening. And so I felt like I needed to share that so people can have an update. But hopefully we can get him on the show one day and and talk further about that because I'm really intrigued by his story. The other thing that I wanted to bring up here is from Victoria, who's the publisher of Six Days in Fallujah, the reimagining of Six Days in Fallujah. Now, Dustin, people will remember that we've discussed this game pretty much pretty in depth. I even did an entire episode about it with um, a military journalist. You guys can go listen to on Sacred Symbols Plus. It's very interesting about what happened in Fallujah and what the consternation is around the combat there and how the story should be told. But People will remember that the developer and the producer and director, kind of Peter Tamte, told Polygon and other websites that they're not really trying to tell a political story. It was just very ham handed. We went over that over in previous podcasts and um, they released a statement that says this, uh, quote, we understand the events recreated in six days in Fallujah are inseparable from politics. Here's how the game gives voice to a variety of perspectives. The stories in Six Days in Fallujah are told through gameplay and documentary footage f- featuring service members and civilians with diverse experiences and opinions about the Iraq war. So uh, I'm sorry, so far, 26 Iraqi civilians and dozens of service members have shared the most difficult moments of their lives with us so we can share them with you in their words. The documentary segments discuss many tough topics, including the events and political decisions that led to the Fallujah battles, as well as their aftermath. While we do not allow players to use white phosphorus as a weapon during gameplay, it is used during described. It is described during the documentary segments. During gameplay, players will participate in stories that are given context through the documentary segments. Each mission challenges players to solve real military and civilian scenarios from the battle interactively, offering a perspective into urban warfare not possible through any other media. We believe the stories of this generation's sacrifices deserve to be told by the Marines, soldiers, and civilians who are there. We trust you will find the game like the events it recreates to be complex. End quote. So not much more to say, but I, I feel like that's kind of the nail in that particular call. We can move on. The, you know. Any thoughts on that saga? I I just feel like it was a series of unforced errors. I'm not even really sure why they spoke to Polygon or put that particular person in front to talk about the game. Right. And I don't even know why they really felt the need to even put out this statement. I mean, at this point, we're just going to have to wait for the game to come out. There's nothing they can say at this point that are going to convince anyone who's against the game. Just at this point, go dark. I agree. Right. It's very similar to the way online hordes work, where like you're never going to please everyone now. And, and now that the, the die is cast, no one's ever really going to give you an opportunity until the product is there and it can speak for itself. So right. I agree. I, I just I really feel like it's a lesson in how important your one burst is and how important it is to put a good face or at least a reasonable face on your announcement. Like I'm always really puzzled, for instance. When I, I get so mad about this and it's so dumb when companies or publishers, developers announce Kickstarters ahead of time. They're like, we're going to launch a Kickstarter April 24th. It's like, why wouldn't you announce it when the Kickstarter is ready? Why wouldn't you say we are kickstarting the game and it, it's ready now? You give someone it's like all these very obvious marketing things. And this is another one where I'm like, what are you doing? You have you have one chance to put your game, you know, to, to announce your game one. And uh they really couldn't have announced it almost any poor, more poorly than they did. So very, very mysterious. Also, I wanted to kind of channel people towards another story. Everyone's writing about this story, but there's not too much information about it yet. Apparently, developers at Electronic Arts that work on FIFA are selling 
have been accused of selling rare ultimate team items a la carte to people. And there's like a big controversy about who's doing it, who they are and all the rest. So it's a really shady thing, especially because people spend so much money. I mean, that's where these sports games make their money is by buying packs of cards. So it seems like some shady FIFA developers have circumvented it and are like basically getting these items out there. Did you read anything about this? Yeah, I saw something about that. I I mean, it's not surprising to me if there's people that have access to the back end that can give themselves rare items, then I don't know, it seems... I don't know. We live in a new era now where there's digital items of sometimes extreme value. And so, you know, it's it's now where developers and different people on the back end are dealing with items of, you know, like I said, really high value. So it's kind of a, a different dynamic now. So I'm not surprised it's happened. The question is, is it true, first of all, because it seems to be kind of up and up in the air. But I wonder what... uh what EA's investigation will find. Yeah, to EA's credit, well, maybe it's not to EA's credit. The FIFA audience hates EA. Uh, I, I've come to learn that over the last few years. Like FIFA players, don't, they buy the game and stuff, but they hate EA. So they do have like a, a super acrimonious relationship with each other, the two sides. And so you are innocent until proven guilty. But it seems like the proof's kind of in the pudding. It's just a matter of if the proof being shown is actually true because there are screenshots of conversations and all of that. But People can go read about it. And when EA issues their findings, then we will talk about it in the, in the news in a more succinct way. But I wanted to put it on everyone's radar for now. Michael wrote into us and says, is it wrong that my regular five guys order is just a plain hamburger? Just bun in one patty. My friends make fun of me for this. Am I mentally disturbed? Hmm. That's something, though. I can't really knock him because... I'm a pretty, you know, minimalist when it comes to to burgers. I'm like meat, cheese, bacon, maybe barbecue sauce. All right. So that's not very minimal. I mean, that's not. It's minimal, just... though. A lot of people get like, you know, lettuce, tomato, onions, all yeah. kinds of stuff. I don't tomato I don't want weird. any of that. Lettuce and tomato is weird. I'm not I don't even really feel like it adds any. Like, what is it really adding? You know? It's weird. Yeah. You know, what does a tomato and a, a slice of tomato and lettuce add to your burger? It seems like yeah. a waste. It's not like a pungent like onion or peppers or something like that. I find it weird. I mean, this is people might remember that have followed me for a long time. I have no idea what happened to him. But a guy that I worked with at IGN named Jim Riley, he used to do the news there. Really weird dude and nice guy. But when we were friends, but very weird guy. And, and his thing was we used to go get burgers all the time, but he would order just hamburger like like a burger on a bun. And I'm like, isn't don't we can't we all agree that while the beef is good and, and the bread is fantastic, that it's also a conduit by which we eat the ketchup, the conduit by which we eat the onions, the cheese, just the beef is a little that's a little weird. I mean, it's like, what do you, I don't know about that. I mean, you have every right to do it. Also, you're saying that your five guys order is just a plain hamburger, just one bun in one patty. Well, that must be the little hamburger then. Right. Because if you just order a hamburger at five guys, they're going to give you two patties. So now you're even. You're even in you're in a little little hamburger territory. It's not not a good place to be. Right. I just don't know if the beef is flavorful enough to carry on its own. Right. Like, I don't know, though, because I've I've done when I've been on like keto and other types of of uh, diets like that, where you just eat like a burger or whatever. But it's stuff that I would make at home. So I'd like make it nice and seasoned with different stuff. So but I just don't know if five guys would be putting in that kind of that kind of effort in just the beef. You know, no, you got to go with everything else because five guys has all the accoutrements, more right. accoutrements than anyone. You got to you got to go in. I mean, you can get a one sauce on your fucking burger at, at five guys. You got to go in and figure it out. So, no, I think you're weird. I think you're mentally disturbed. I don't think you deserve five guys, Michael. And I think. You really need to think about why don't you just go to McDonald's? Why don't you just get a plain hamburger out of one of those white wrappers? You know, you'd save a lot of money doing that. That's what I was thinking is like, why yeah. are you going to five guys if you're just getting, you know, plain Jane? That's another good point because they charge you the same amount no matter what you put on it. So that's a great point. That's a great point. Caleb Harrison wrote into us and said, hey, guys, we're going to try our hand at vegetable gardening this year, but we can't decide what we should grow. What vegetables do you think we should prioritize? 
We live on the parad- paradisical utopian island known as Oklahoma. In case you need to consult your farmer's al- almanac. Thanks and be well. Oklahoma, I mean, you got to grow corn and wheat. I don't want to hear any more about vegetables. That's not what you guys do there. You don't want to. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We have California and we have Florida and Texas for fruit and all the other weird things. You grow corn and you grow wheat. And I don't want to hear another word about it. I don't want to hear another word about it. What do they what do they call you in your in your state? Corn huskers. Correct. They don't call you bell pepper growers. They don't call you potato diggers. They call you corn huskers. So I think the answer is corn. Wow. And some wheat. Dustin, do you have any thoughts? I, I don't know if there's anything that, that can be said after that. I mean, I hate gardening, so I'd say don't garden at all. Oh, he's from Oklahoma, not Nebraska. So they're not corn huskers there. Nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless, everything null and void now. Yeah, null and void. Just forget everything I said. <laughs> All those states also. I mean, let's be honest. I've been to many of those places. I, there's a few places I haven't been in the United States, but. Montana and Utah and Colorado outside of Denver, these are these states kind of blur together. By the time you get into Oklahoma and Nebraska and the Dakotas, it's like, come on, guys. You know, there's no differentiation between any of these places. There's not. And I don't say that as an insult. There's really no differentiation between Virginia, North Carolina and South Carolina. You know, there's no differentiation between Alabama, Mississippi and Louisiana. These are all the same. I think we should start truncating the states. Just don't put Pennsylvania and Ohio together at all costs. I will not allow it. No, that can't be done. Ohio has to be on its own. Not because they're special, because they deserve it. Yeah, that's true. Well, I, I'm obsessed with the idea. You know, we're trying to get two more states into the union right now in the maybe three, but really two in the form of Puerto Rico and Washington, D.C. And I have no problem with that per se, but I like the 50 kind of thing we got going on. And so I feel like we need to merge other states together if this is going to happen. Oh. And I think that the co- putting the Dakotas together is one of those states that needs to happen. And maybe giving West Virginia back to Virginia since you know West Virginia was founded in the Civil War. We can kind of come back together now. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I have thought about that. If there was 51 or 52 states, that would really bother me. Oh, it's going to happen. And the, you should, people, I'm sure people know this, but there are official designs from the government of what, of what a 51, 52, 53, et cetera, star flag looks like. And you guys should go look them up because you'll be pretty staggered by how different the flag looks. Um, and you'll notice when there's going to be 51 or 52 stars. All right. Yeah. So, Caleb, I don't know. I don't know what any of that was about, but thank you for writing in. Are you looking? I'm looking at it now. It is it is borderline shocking. Yeah. To see. Because it, it, at some point, like 50, we had a 49 star flag for a little while, but we were at 48 and then 50 for a long periods of time. And those two flags looked great. But when you start getting in the odd numbers, it starts getting a little weird. You know, so. All right. Dustin, what are we playing? I know what you're playing. It says Duresene, which I'm really interested to hear more about. Right. So we had a conversation last week about diving back into PlayStation VR. And so I pulled mine out and I realized because I was asking some people online, like what PSVR exclusives should I check out? And I was going through it. I'm like, man, I've actually played quite a bit. I need to fill in the gaps. So where else to start other than from software? You know, my my current uh studio of choice with their game um i've been trying to figure out how to play it i think it's durasane when i looked up a google like how to say this but i really don't know yeah the accents are it's there's an accent over the both e's right and they're both accent agus the ones that go from left to right (laughs) so that's uh right or it durasane yeah a is that the e with the accent agu accent grav goes the other way and that's uh i think Colin, you realize who you're speaking to right now. Yeah, I know. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, go on. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, Duracine, D- D- Duracine, it's from software's only VR game. It's $20. And it's very interesting for them as a studio just because they're known for Dark Souls, Bloodborne, which all have these hideous beasts, the undead, all kinds of... Um, eldritch beings literally in some some cases so 
This one is quite different in that you are a fairy that is inhabiting this school or it's an orphanage, I believe. And so I'm only probably about maybe an hour into it, but it's pretty minimal overall in its gameplay in that it's it, you'll hear like conversations between people. You'll solve some light puzzles. You're not doing anything crazy but what i'm enjoying about it the most is that from software has very signature environments i guess is the way i'll put it in that when i'm when i'm in the headset i'm like wow this sort of feels like being in a room from bloodborne but it's not quite so it's been uh it's been cool to play and just because i i have such an uh, admiration for Miyazaki, the director. He directed the Dark Souls games, except for two, and Bloodborne and Sekiro. And so, to see him take on this entirely, in I mean, it's not an entirely new medium, but it's a whole new way of of doing games. So, yeah, that's been it's been cool to check out. But I will say, I was a little disappointed because I got my VR headset out, which I used just a couple of weeks ago for Hitman. VR like I played a little bit of it and the like the puff on the top on the forehead part is like peeling off and so when I took off the headset I had like black you know speckles of foam all oh, over weird. me interesting so, I didn't know that that was even happening it's disappointing because I was actually quite amped to play VR this week and I went and got my VR unit out. it's actually been on my it's just been I have like one of those holding units. So it just sits there like a like a fake head almost on my uh, my uh, entertainment center. And so I was ready to go and I got the HDMI cables and I got the processing box. And I even went on Amazon and bought a new like 12 volt plug because I couldn't find the original and I had everything going. And lo and behold, like it's not it's broken, like something with it doesn't work. I think it's the processing box, but I'm not sure. So I can't play. Now, there are two things about this. Number one, people were like, Colin, go buy another one. And I'm like, no, uh, just because a person can afford something doesn't mean you should go buy it. And in fact, that is the core of the poverty mentality. So anyone who has those kinds of instincts, you should automatically try to override those instincts, even if you have lots of money or no money at all. The instinct should always be the same, like don't spend money and let it burn in a hole in your pocket just because you can. So I started kind of messing around with it. I'm like, how can I figure this out? I don't quite remember. I played Moss. That was the last game I played. So that was two plus years ago. So I was like, I'm pretty sure when you put the processing box on it, the light comes on and you can pass through to the PS4 without having the headset on. So I'm like, something's broken here. And the only way I can figure it out is to either buy a new one, which is again, not going to happen, or I can borrow someone else's. And so and I, I'm eager to buy, borrow someone else's. And I think I'm a little loath to buy a new one specifically because I don't know what is broken, because if it's the headset, for instance, then, yeah, it's probably worth buying a new one. But if it's like the processor, I can get one of those on eBay for like 50 bucks. So so there's that as well. But then so so I was kind of looking around about and fi- trying to think, like, who can lend me their VR units, not using it. And just so I can f- plug and play and figure it out what's broken and then maybe use it a little bit. And then I realized, and Chris isn't here to, def- to defend himself today. I was like, in 2018, I bought Chris a, jo- it was a, it was a joke gift. Uh, last stand technically bought a form of a PSVR unit, which I wrapped in paper towels and I gave it to him. Right. And uh, I think it was for Christmas or something. And he's never played it. He doesn't want to play it. I don't think. And so I was like, is it possible that I went back to the past from the future bought Chris his PlayStation VR unit so that two and a half years later he can gift it to me back because the solution is Chris is going to send me that unit and it's not with him yet it's still traveling to California by freight but I thought that was so funny because I'm like the the people bust balls with Chris all the time not having played it but the fact that he hasn't played it and it's neatly packed means he can just overnight it to me and then I can test my own VR unit so I thought that was kind of strange but disappointing nonetheless because I was really ready to go and I was I was reading about I was reading about Iron Man and I was reading about uh, Dressene and I was reading about 
I knew I wanted to play Vacation Simulator, which I hadn't played yet, and others. And then I was like, I can't fucking play anything. So, like, I was like, actually pretty crestfallen because I was actually in the mode. You know, I was ready right. to go. I was five minutes away from playing because I was everything was plugged in. You know, you have all the cords. You got the USB. Dude, it's the it's USB cord deal. plugging into the front of the console. You got the fucking HDMI cables going all over the place. I'm like, all right, everything's good. I, and also, I'm testing every cable to make sure that they work. So it's not the cables. And so that was that was my PSVR experience, unfortunately, because I was ready to go. So mm-hmm. I, that's what I was going to ask. You already mentioned you're looking at like Iron Man um vacation simulator stuff like that the question is colin will you dive back in to one of my all-time favorite vr games tetris effect i it's true i actually did play tetris effect on vr as well oh you did oh you already did you're good well yeah it was hooked because that was that was um that was fall 2018 right tetris effect sounds right because that was when i that was like the last time i played vr like really played it and that was when i played moss and like a couple other things so i think it was around the same time because it was available and you could play it in there. But I, I love Tetris Effect, as you know. I would prefer to just play it and almost anything else on a TV. But there are there's a lot of things out there. Like there's that Walking Dead game that looks pretty good. Yeah. I never beat the the Until Dawn complimentary game. I never I don't think I even like went all the way through Batman. I really think that there are just a few games that I played all the way through on VR because it just kind of came and went for me. So did you play? Are you so are you into rhythm games at all? A little bit. Uh, I, I, I are you gonna ask about super hot and stuff like that? I was gonna say Beat Saber. Oh, and Beat Saber is very fun. Yeah, I don't know. I, I it's always the best selling or one of the best selling VR games. It's not. Yeah, <clears throat> there's no question about it. I just don't know that that's what I'm really looking for. I think the game that's most attractive to me right now, or the few games, is like Farpoint is free and it looks pretty good. Although I think I already own it. I kind of want to mess around with that because I don't think I've played a shooter yet, actually, which is strange. Um, and Eve Valkyrie was the game that turned me on to VR and I, I never really sat down with it either. And I feel like that's like the perfect game for VR. So right. there's a lot I wanted to play and I was really looking forward to it, but I, n- I didn't get a chance to do so. So instead, I um, there were four g- other games that I played. A few of them I've talked about on the show, so I won't spend too much time. I'm still kind of messing around with Generation Zero. I actually got some messages from people thanking me for turning them back onto it because it is totally different now. It's it's not very good. I'm, I'm, I will reiterate, it's not very good. But there's something weird about it that makes me want to keep playing it because it's so vague. I think people will see it's so empty and vague, but in a really eerie way. There's something interesting about that game. And then SteamWorld Dig, I'm still playing on Vita, although I think I don't really want to play much of it anymore. I don't necessarily like it that much. Like it's I want to like it more than I do. I feel like I reach. I feel like the, the whole oil lamp thing's annoying. I feel like there's just certain things where I'm like this going back and up and down and, and I, I don't know. I'm not feeling it, but I, I maybe I'll stick with it uh, a little longer. And then Sparklight is the game I was talking about last week. I platinumed it. Finally, Sparklight is a Zelda like roguelike game. And it's uh, by a studio thing called Blue Red or Red Blue, something like that there. It's a really good game. It's cute. It's whimsical. The music's really good. And it's quite manageable. And I enjoyed it. I, I highly recommend people at least ch- check it out, see if it's for you. And then, you know what I started playing? Is Ratchet and Clank. Oh. 2016 Ratchet and Clank. Now, I played it when Going it came back. out and I beat it. But I, I remember at the time that I played it and just played it, which is rare for me, where I'm like, I'm just going to play the game so I can play it. And that's like what I did with Uncharted 4 and other things. Like, I had like a weird year that last year, kind of funny. And so I was like, you know, I want to sit with Ratchet. I love this series going way back. And I would like to play this in Platinum it before June when the new one comes out, which plenty of time. And to remind everyone, this game is free for everybody right now. I already owned it, but you can download it for free right now in March, even if you don't own or even if you don't have PS Plus, everyone can download it. It's their play at home game. And I got to say, man, that game is so good. I mean, it's it's so good. And it really got me reinvigorated and and more excited about the next ratchet game because the characters are so lovable the 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 writing is so funny the writing makes me laugh and the gameplay is on point it's just it's a really wonderful game so i wanted to give a shout out to ratchet and clank 2016 specifically because there's no entry even to to, to play it right now no entry fee at all if even if you're just a ps plusless plebeian on playstation network you can download it for free 
So please do. It's weird to think back on that game that it's technically a movie tie-in game. Yeah, they did that weird movie. And we, we had talked about that a few weeks ago, too. There's like another animated yeah. show that from that same studio that like Sony doesn't even acknowledge. Um, it is weird. And, and it, it's funny because in the Ratchet game, they, they mentioned the movie. Oh, uh, kind of like the cross. They're making fun of the cross. It's a it's a self-aware game about making fun of its cross license and stuff like that. Right. It's it, they do mention multiple times like you know, animated stuff or whatever. So maybe we should watch that movie. I don't know. It, it, I, apparently it wasn't great, but I don't know. It's, it's a, a movie based on a, a PlayStation IP. So maybe we should watch it at some point. I'm just much more interested about where Sly Cooper went. Cause people will remember that. Right. There was a 100 plus episode run of Sly Cooper cartoon cartoons that was announced and we've never seen it. Like it's just, I don't think ever come out. So there's a lot of weird stuff going on with PlayStation productions. Meanwhile, as we know, they're they're emphasizing a twisted metal live action TV show. It's like, okay, fair enough. Have you ever stopped to think about the money you're wasting? Not in huge amounts, but just here and there. You'd probably be shocked and not in a good way if you saw just how much money you could cut from your monthly array of expenses and saddened to know how much better you could have spent that money on other stuff like video games, for instance. Hell, you could even save that money. And do you know where you're probably spending too much each and every month? Your mobile bill. Which is why my friends at Mint Mobile have a tantalizing offer that may just shake you out of your financial complacency. Because their phone plans start at an almost unimaginable and unbelievable, yet still entirely true, $15 a month. How does this company extract any profit from such a meager ask? It's simple, really. They're a modern 21st century business that has foregone a brick and mortar existence, conducting its operation entirely online. That means they have much lower overhead than their ancient competitors, and they can therefore pass along that savings to you. And trust me, as the gaming industry's most notorious Luddite, even I was able to navigate Mint Mobile's website with ease. So just imagine how rapidly you, person who understands technology, can start saving on your phone bill. Every plan Mint Mobile offers has unlimited talk and text, and data is delivered over the nation's largest 5G network. So you're getting savings and quality, a typically irresistible combination in my experience. And you can even make the switch right now with the phone you're using, keeping the number you already have and receiving a seven day, 100% money back guarantee. So if you're not happy, you can switch back to the old decrepit service you currently use. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, plus get everything you need to make the switch ship directly to your door free of charge, head to mintmobile.com slash sacred. That's M-I-N-T-M-O-B-I-L-E dot com slash S-A-C-R-E-D and begin saving right this moment. Right this moment. Again, head to mintmobile.com slash sacred to cut your wireless bill to $15 a month. That's mintmobile.com slash sacred. All right, let's get into the news. The big news, of course, really is most germane to Xbox. However, we do need to talk about it here, and a lot of people did write in about it. So number one, the deal is officially done. Microsoft has acquired ZeniMax, the parent company behind Bethesda, and therefore Xbox is now the official home of all of that group's studios and IP. Phil Spencer, the head of Microsoft's Xbox initiative, wrote on Xbox Wire in part. That's a kind of a weird way to put it because there's a studio called the initiative, Xbox, the Xbox group. Wrote on Xbox Wire in part, quote, this is the next step in building an industry leading first party studios team, a commitment we have to our Xbox community. With the addition of the Bethesda creative teams, gamers should know that Xbox consoles, PC and Game Pass will be the best place to experience new Bethesda games, including some new titles in the future that will be exclusive to Xbox and PC players, end quote. However, a couple of days later, Spencer noted on a live stream the following, quote, we have games that exist on other platforms and we're going to support those games on the platforms they're on. There are communities of players. We love those communities and we will continue to invest in them. And even in the future, there might be things that have either contractual things or legacy on different platforms that will go to. But if you're an Xbox customer, the thing I want you to know is this is about delivering great exclusive games for you that ship on platforms where Game Pass exists and quote in the deal. Six notable studios join Xbox's first party. But that's the game studios. Tango Gameworks, Arcane, Machine Games, id Software and ZeniMax Online. In addition, the following IP are now owned by Microsoft. Fallout, The Elder Scrolls, Doom, Dishonored, Prey, Wolfenstein, Starfield, Rage, and others. They also own id Tech. Founded in 1986 as a publisher, Bethesda began internal development of games under the moniker some 20 years ago. All right, so what did you make of this, this week's 
uh, happenings here beginning early in the week. So the, the sequence of events are ZeniMax is a European company. You're, they are given clearance in the European market for the sale. That was step one. The sale was then finalized. The Xbox Wire and Bethesda blog posted. Two days later, they then had um, their roundtable video. So there's three different pieces that give us where we are today. What, what, do, what do you make of everything taken together? So it's interesting because it still feels maybe not quite as vague, but there's still being vague overall i would say it's um i don't know i've seen people throw in and be like look i was right or look uh, i was wrong and i'm like well there's still kind of just a little bit of we'll say debatability in some of phil's statements which i think that for the most part they've made it clear he's like this is about making exclusive games but the one thing that he did say is about there are communities of players. We love those communities and we'll continue to invest in them. And in the future, there may be things that have either contractual things or legacy on different platforms. What is what is specifically when he says legacy on different platforms? That's that's the the big if right there, we'll say. Like, does that mean, oh, Elder Scrolls has a legacy of fans on PlayStation just as well as Xbox and PC. But Starfield doesn't. So Starfield is an exclusive, but when Elder Scrolls, we're gonna put that everywhere. I don't know. Yeah, I know and here's the thing. It's, yeah. The conversation is has gotten I'm just gonna say a little annoying to me at this point because I know there are people listening that already want they want to like break their speaker because of the fact that I would even suggest the fact that some of these games would come to PlayStation. And there's other people that are like cheering me on in the fact that I'm suggesting that they could come to PlayStation. I'm leaning into the fact that we there's still some vagueness. Does that make sense? No, I think that I think you're right. I should clarify Zenimax is an American company, so they had to go through EU commission stuff separately. Um, so that didn't make any sense when I said that the I agree with you. Here's the thing. Here's my problem. And this is, I think, what I'll go into with Maddie more on Monday as well. I'm probably not the best combatant in this particular field for multiple reasons. First of all, I don't really care about Bethesda. I mean, I, I'm not trying to be a dickhead, but and I, I think people that know my, my taste in games. What's the last Bethesda game that I really liked uh, outside of? You know, I love Wolfenstein and I love Doom. I still don't really consider either of those Bethesda games. I mean, they are. It has been with Bethesda for a long time. Uh, it was through that connection with Wolfenstein that that was given to machine games and all of that. So I get all of the back end stuff. But when I think about Bethesda, I'm like, I don't know that I really give a shit. Like, it's like uh, that's kind of how I really feel, because when I think about Fallout 76, I think about Fallout 4. I think about the Elder Scrolls 5 on PS3. I think about other things and I'm like, I don't know that they don't deliver games that I want to play anyway. So I feel like kind of a, a reluctant combatant. That's probably not the best person to give the let's call the pro PlayStation side. If you want to call it that, even though I'm never really pro PlayStation, as people that know this, that listen to the show. No, I guess there are probably better people that can make the argument than me because I'm not making it from a, I can't believe it. the games won't be on PlayStation anymore because I don't care. You know, like, I, I'm sorry, I just don't care. Like, well, they haven't shown me anything and I'll just play Doom and Wolfenstein on Xbox. So it's not really a big deal. I have Xbox, I have a PC. It's like, I don't need to do all these other things, you know? So I want to throw that out there because I know that some of the audience, to your point, is also going to come here expecting me to make the case as to why this really affects PlayStation. And it does and it does hurt PlayStation, but it doesn't. It's not something I speak from with passion because it's not like if Microsoft went and bought Capcom or Square Enix, that would have been a very urgent thing for me to follow. And that could, that would have had very urgent ramifications for the way I play video games. This really doesn't. I didn't like Prey. You know, I don't care about Dishonored. I don't care about Rage. I really don't care about Fallout. I have no interest in Elder Scrolls 6 because it's not coming out for probably 10 years. Starfield. I don't know. You show me, I guess. So I, I, I do need to say that that said that said, I think that this is a, a substantial deal. And what I get frustrated about with it 
is because I still feel like, like you said, Phil Spencer just won't say anything. It's really becoming annoying because people are like, well, it's definitively said it here. I'm like, no, he didn't. You know, it's just that, like, I think now it's clear that I'm probably wrong about my about what I was saying about what they were going to do with their games. And I'm not I'm simply not willing to fight this battle anymore because it's like I don't I'm not invested enough in this. If we were going to go into Capcom and Square Enix and these other publishers that I really like, then that would be a different story. But I feel like the what I try to tell people online, especially on Twitter, whenever you know everyone dunked on me yesterday, it's fine. I mean, that's that's part of the process of making proclamations, especially sure. when people like me remind you of how often I'm right. Then certainly you have the right to tell me when I'm wrong. So I'm not worried about that. I'm not upset about that. Dunk on me away or dunk away on me. But I just feel like, why can't they speak more candidly? And I still feel like they're not. And I, I, I think I connect all of the dots from the way Phil Spencer has always been. And people were, don't you don't, doesn't anyone remember when Square Enix and Tomb Raider were Xbox exclusives and they were in quotes and they like kept calling them exclusives and they weren't and everyone knew they weren't, but they kept calling them exclusives anyway and pretending that these games weren't coming to PlayStation. I can't help but escape that. And I think you're right. They gave themselves wiggle room in multiple ways in this statement because I said on Twitter, why wouldn't they just cock the shotgun, stick it in PlayStation's gut and fire it? You know, why wouldn't you do that? And it's because I don't think that they're confident that they're going to actually go down that road, you know, because if I owned and bought Bethesda and I was like, we have Fallout, we have Starfield, we have Doom, pa-pow, 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 PlayStation exclusive, pa-pow, PlayStation exclusive, you would think they would just be like, yeah, these games are only going to be on Xbox and PC. Instead, they even use the terminology where Game Pass exists. Like, what does that mean, dude? You know, why can't you just speak clearly? It's it's that's the kind of thing that annoys me. And it's becoming Phil Spencer's specialty is to speak this really weird shit. And I don't like it. And I think that it's not. So I have no problem being wrong. It's just that when I explain or maybe being wrong, but I feel like my mentality of how I got to the conclusion makes a lot of sense. And I still feel like the conclusion that I drew about what they should be doing makes more sense than what they're what it seems like they're going to be doing. Um does that make sense to you what I'm saying? I, yeah. I went on there for a while. So, yeah. no, I have a question. Just I've heard this argument and I don't I don't know enough about the legal aspects of it to say whether it's a good argument, but I've heard that Phil and and Microsoft in general needs to be vague at the moment because of the existing contracts they have with PlayStation. They can't come out and say Bethesda games are exclusive because that could potentially interfere in the sales of the contract they have for Deathloop and Ghostwire Tokyo. And who knows, there could be other games that aren't announced that Bethesda made contracts with Sony beforehand. That's comp- that's still in the realm of possibility. Definitely, especially because even with Obsidian publishing, which is was later bought by Microsoft, publishing Outer Worlds through Private Division, DLC is coming out for that on PlayStation this week. So there are weird tendrils. I agree with you. I mean, they they do need to circumvent that. And I appreciate that they they basically said that that we're going to we're going to uphold our contractual obligations. I don't think I said this eloquently enough, and I don't think a lot of people understood it last week because we got some people writing in about uh, some confusion. I was a little confused about why Sony, maybe they did, but why Sony, when this deal was bubbling, wouldn't have gone to them and said, like, you can take these games back. And we want considerations on future titles. So in other words, let's make Tokyo uh, Ghostwire Tokyo a multi-plat game. Let's make um, Arcane's game Deathloop a, a, an upcoming uh, multi-platform game. But then let's maybe give us access to Starfield. Give us, a, you know, I don't know if those kinds of things happen, but I was like, that would be interesting leverage to get Microsoft out of making PlayStation games. And instead making multi-platform games with some back end considerations, very similar to the way trades work in, you know, sports where it's like you get a, you get consideration in two years, depending on how this player plays and how many downs he plays and all of that. And so I feel like they could have done something similar there, but I really feel at the end of the day, two items are true and people are really reluctant to accept one of these, especially Microsoft fans. And I got to say, my interaction with Xbox fans isn't very pleasant online. It's a different breed. Um, I know PlayStation fans are obnoxious. I read you guys too, but a different breed. The Xbox fans, not very nice people. Some of them, but 
here's one thing that needs to be said. Game Pass isn't profitable. It's not probably anywhere near being profitable. And people kind of conflate Aaron Greenberg, uh, Aaron Greenberg and Phil Spencer saying like, oh, we're not trying to. It's not it's not we're not hemorrhaging money and blah, 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 guys. The, Game Pass isn't profitable. There's no way Game Pass is profitable. Uh, streaming platforms are notoriously money eating long term investments. Netflix was losing billions of dollars a quarter on their streaming service. Disney Plus, who owns all of the shit that they're they're on there, are still losing hundreds of millions of dollars a quarter on Disney Plus. So, of course, they're losing money on on Game Pass. And so my thought was, Dustin, and I thought it was pretty logical. To attract more people to Game Pass, you must go poaching in a more active way. You must go get PlayStation gamers. And I still say the best way to get them is to make your games available to them and charge them $70 for them. Or just go get an Xbox with a Game Pass subscription and play anything you want. And if you do that over and over and over again, I think some people are going to be like, we don't need we we get the we get the point. You know, we're going to pay $70 for Doom. We're going to pay $70 for The Elder Scrolls, $70 for Starfield, $70 for uh, Wolfenstein 3, $70 for Prey 2, whatever the case might be, or $15 a month. You get it all. And that still makes the most sense. And I still think that that is what Microsoft wants. And I think that's why they said where Game Pass is available. I think if Microsoft had their way, it would be available on PlayStation and it would be available on Switch. I think you'll see Game Pass on Switch first. Does does that make sense to you, though? Not only where my mind was in order for that, because to me, I was like, you can't just sit back passively. If you make an investment like this, you need to go hunting people. You need to show them not only the high caliber of your game, but how much cheaper it can be on the other platform. And to me, I was like, the most aggressive way you can do that is to simply go sell those games. Um, So that's number one. But then also just the idea um, of back end deals that could keep these games flowing to PlayStation. But again, I'm just not the best messenger for this because I'm not really that crestfallen about it at all. You know, it's like out of all of the big publishers that make game, independent publishers. So your Ubisoft, your Bethesda's, your Capcom's, your Square Enix's, your Activision's, whatever. The, the one I care about the least is Bethesda. So while it's huge for Microsoft and I want to kind of save more of that commentary for later. I don't know that we lo- that I, I don't know that I as a gamer lose too much from this deal. PlayStation gamers definitely do. Anyway, what? so how do you think we lose as a PlayStation audience from this in ways obvious and not obvious? So something that I've been thinking about this, because I was thinking about the nature of exclusives and how those affect the consumers. And I just I've come to the conclusion that I'm never going to cheer for making for a game that once was multi-plat to be removed. And so it's only exclusive to, to certain people and both, both companies are guilty of this. And I'm not saying it's an, an unfortunate reality of, of this business and how, you know, consoles get sold, right? Like PlayStation probably spent a shit ton of money to get Final Fantasy 16 and before that even Final Fantasy 7 remake exclusively on PlayStation. And yeah, I think that that kind of sucks for the Xbox gamers that played either Final Fantasy 13 or Final Fantasy 15 on Xbox and maybe they now have a history with that franchise and now they're not able to play that. That was plucked away from them. And that's what's happening also with Bethesda in that, as I mentioned earlier, there are uh, communities of people who play Bethesda games on PlayStation. There are thousands, thousands upon thousands of Elder Scrolls and Fallout fans on PlayStation that now if they want to continue to engage with that franchise, they must purchase another platform. And so, like I said, it's an unfortunate reality of how this business works, but I get a, a weird gross feeling when I see people cheering for this because they want their side to win. This comes back to the, the fanboy conversation that we had last week. Like in the end, sure. Maybe this deal with Xbox and Bethesda will lead to 
a more successful Bethesda. That's everyone's hope. I would, I would hope that that would be everyone's hope is that they can now make games that they weren't able to before. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's not something to celebrate at the same time. And I say that as, you know, someone also that saw other independent developers get purchased up by, by Sony. It's like we've been saying the consolidation of the industry is something that I'm not so sure is a good thing. Yeah. I'm cons- I'm concerned about it too. I'm more concerned about Saudi and Chinese money in the industry than I am about the consolidation of Western entities. So Zenimax and Microsoft getting together doesn't bother me. I, I should also note, and I should have said this earlier, I'm a Microsoft shareholder. So financially, this is great for me. You know, like I'm, I'm totally happy about that. But I agree with you. Like it's it's weird to see the reconsolidation of an industry that was trying to kind of get rid of those shackles for a long time and go independent. I think people realize that it's hard to sustain yourself without publishers just because it requires you to take all the financial risk and it's not something people are willing to do. So they give away control and they give away their IP in order to have security and people helping them. And I respect that, but the consolidation does inherently mean very similar to what we're seeing in streaming platforms with Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, and everyone else. There's going to be a bunch of verticals where things are going to be sealed off and siloed off. Like I refuse to get Paramount plus, right? Yeah. But that was the only way you can legally watch the, um, the Oprah interview with Meghan Markle. Right. And I'm like, fucking Christ, like I'm not getting Paramount plus, you know, and as long as things don't go down that road, I think we're OK. I, I've expressed that fear in the past about how I'm afraid that like Square Enix or Capcom or these others are going to make their own streaming services just like you Ubi- or their own Ubisoft. You know, Ubisoft already has theirs going and others that I get a little bit more afraid of. I hope we have a more old school Hulu type approach where companies get together and make their own, which is what Hulu originally was. It's not that way anymore. So. I'm a, I am concerned about the consolidation. This consolidation doesn't bother me as much as others like SNK being purchased up by the Saudi crown prince sucks and Chinese 10 cent money go, getting embedded into all sorts of developers sucks. This doesn't really suck from that perspective. I think that they overpaid for this. I think that when you compare Insomniac for two hundred and twenty nine million dollars to seven point five billion dollars for studios, a couple of which are as good, maybe. Um, I think more you're paying for the IP. I also think you can't understate, as I said earlier, Dustin, that it's uh, id tech. I was actually really compelled yeah. by that. They can Microsoft can now license id tech and, and id and Bethesda have not really licensed id tech to anyone in recent years. It's shit, man. The old id tech licenses are how a bunch of developers came to be uh, like Raven and others getting involved in the 90s. So there's exciting things that Microsoft can do there, too. But I love what you said about the lineage thing. Um, because Daniel Nichols wrote in about this and said, I'm going to keep it simple. How should we construe Phil Spencer's recent comments about Bethesda's exclusivity? He did say some titles with legacy on other platforms will remain there. Which titles do you think they are? You would ask this too. And I don't really know because when, even when you honestly think about Bethesda, they have an Xbox slanted heritage going back to the original Xbox. It wasn't until Elder Scrolls four that we ever got an Elder Scrolls game on PlayStation. It was Elder Morrowind was on Xbox, as people might remember, Elder Scrolls 3 and before that those were PC games. Same thing with Fallout. Fallout 3 came out day and date to PS3, but people will remember that there was a 6-month DLC exclusive window with those 5 DLC packs on Fallout 3 that went to Microsoft. Um Doom had Microsoft related stuff and others. So when I think about the games, I'm like I don't think there I don't know that there's too much to think about here. Elder Scrolls doesn't have a PlayStation heritage and I don't think Doom has a PlayStation heritage and I don't think even Wolfenstein has a PlayStation heritage. I think what they're talking about, honestly and unfortunately, is Minecraft and Elder Scrolls Online in that regard. I don't know that I don't know that they're going to go like Dishonored had a PlayStation heritage. It's like, well, it was on PlayStation. I don't know that, you know, Prey was on PlayStation, but I don't know. So I don't know. That comment is interesting. It's an interesting hanging participle, as it were, dangling participle. But I don't I don't know what that particularly means. I'm more interested in what you said, which was, does that commentary basically can we basically conclude that anything new? Right. So like Starfield. I feel like you can wipe that out at a PlayStation. 
Like, I don't think that's going to happen. But does it mean the Elder Scrolls six is going to come to PlayStation? I don't know. It's a tough it's a tough situation. I, I don't know. But people also want to talk, Dustin, about what this means for Sony. And Jehudi wrote into us and said, hi, guys. Hope you are well. Where is Sony's response to all the progress Microsoft has made recently? It seems as though everyone is making studio acquisitions in the industry, but with Japan studios seeming decline, it seems Sony is doing the opposite. I'm all for nurturing teams, but it feels like PlayStation is being left behind by moves made by Sony. We need more games and we need them soon. What do you think PlayStation needs to do to reassert dominance? Keep up the good work and much love to you all. Do you think Sony is losing a dominant position because of moves like this? Not right now. I mean... I don't want to sound like a hater, but really, what is the compelling piece of software outside of Halo Infinite on Xbox this year? I feel like they really kind of messed up this launch, right? We're going to talk about it later, but Worse PlayStation than Sony, 5 is the fastest selling console of all time. Yeah. You know what I mean? And we've got Horizon, God of War, um, all within the first two years. So to me, it's like they're they're still on the fighting, you know, what, I know it's, what's the way I'm looking to say this? They're they're still the leader because they are still hopefully we'll, we'll have yet to see. Maybe these games will be trash. It doesn't seem like it, though, based on the precedent of these studios in the entire last generation, that these games are going to be blockbuster titles that. There's certain games that like the industry, everyone comes together and plays this game at the same time. Everyone is going to be, you know, chomping at the bit to play Horizon and the next God of War. I just don't know if Xbox has that kind of cachet. I mean, Halo Infinite, sure. But there's there's been a lot of um, mixed feelings about that game. So that's kind of a wild card right now. So. If I were Sony, this is not the time to make rash moves because Xbox made a big purchase. I think that they continue to double down on making exclusive first party, right? Um, and I, I don't want it to sound, I don't want to sound hypocritical about this first party because I was saying how removing people from playing games sucks. When And what I specifically meant was removing a third party game and taking it away. Yeah, something that was at one time available. Right. Yeah. I want. I just want that to be crystal clear for everybody. So Sony doubling down on this, you know, industry stopping games and that sell, you know, millions of units. That's where I think they continue to be the market leader. It's I'm, I'm torn on this one. Because I think. The, the major challenge with Microsoft clearly is going to be managing these studios. They basically have doubled their their growth in the last two and a half years or three years since they bought those that slate of studios like Obsidian and Ninja Theory. And they haven't really come out with anything from those studios yet. Now they have of any consequence. Now they have a whole new slate of studios. And it's about managing this team of like 25 which is twice as big as Sony's. And I think I said it several times in previous episodes, Dustin, which is if Microsoft can get this organized, they can and should have a massive AAA release every quarter right. forever. But it's a matter of getting there and managing those assets. And to your point, they've completely mismanaged their assets. And this is part of the reason why I think maybe Phil Spencer and Aaron Greenberg and these guys get a little too much credit is because, yeah, you went and bought these studios. It's cer certainly a couple of the studios they bought last time. I would have loved to see with PlayStation like Obsidian and others, but they don't seem to manage these studios extremely well. And I think the more you add bloat, the more you're requiring production, the more you're requiring an architecture around the studios that works within the micro Microsoft studio platform, the bigger you get, the harder that gets. And I think that's why Sony started shutting down some of their studios about 10 years ago, because it was becoming too unwieldy. And so they are taking a different tact, but I must admit as a PlayStation fan, I want to know what they're going to buy. I, I also want to know, I think it goes two ways. There are some studios that are available that they should look at. And there are some publishers that they can buy if they wanted to, that could be a very equivalent move for them. 
if Sony went and bought Capcom, for instance, which they could afford, or if they bought Square Enix, which they could also afford, it would just be loan money for a long period of time, then that's pretty counteractive. But I think Sony realizes you don't need to buy the cow to get the milk. And that's right. That they can extract second party games from studios on a one off basis in which you totally limit your exposure to any downside apart from the game, the mate, the making of the one game. Sometimes this works really well. I think Quantic Dream games really worked in this environment. Sometimes games work not very well. I think the Order 1886 was one of those games as well. But I'm eager to see what they buy next. I didn't expect them to buy Insomniac. And when I look around, I, I keep saying Blue Point is the obvious team, but I understand why Sony fans are a little worried. It's like, well, where where are our studios? You know, and it's kind of it kind of sucks because the big boys have just went. So we're not going to see a Naughty Dog AAA single player game in a long time. We're, we're not going to see another game from Sucker Punch in a long time or Bend or any of these guys. And so people are eager. What I would really love to know, though, Dustin, and this is unknowable for us, is what are this? Inevitably, they have pe- biz dev people always looking at acquisitions. And it's like, what are the studios they want to buy? You know, they must have a list of small list of studios. Like if these were available, we would or, you know, should we try to get from software? Can we try to try to get someone else? So I, I don't know. I, I, I understand both sides of the argument, but I do think. To your point, Sony's more deliberate approach with AAA games is undeniable. And someone had said something to me, which might be true, where and I think Phil Spencer has said this, where like Game Pass allows people to buy more games. And I'm like, that's fine. Yet Xbox games never chart, (laughs) you know. So. Where are you making your money? How are you making your money? How passively or actively are you making your money? So many unknown questions here. And um, it's really going to be fascinating to watch how this unlocks over time. And what we might get as PlayStation gamers from that ecosystem, apart from the obvious. Because I really don't think that I don't think they're making the right choice. In terms of growing Game Pass. It almost seems contradictory with what they've been doing for a long time. They seem to have wanted to be as ubiquitous as possible until right now, you know, and right. that's fine. I mean, I always thought it was weird that they wanted to be ubiquitous, but I'm simply analyzing their moves based on that. And uh, I still say that Game Pass would be on PlayStation if Sony would allow it. So what would that look like, though? Like, let's just play a hypothetical game because people have been talking about this. Like they, the fact they said a platform platforms where there is Game Pass. Now, to be clear, I don't think that Sony would have to be on its last leg, I think, to allow Game Pass on PlayStation. But I was thinking about that. I'm like, what would that look like? Is there a reality where that could happen? Yeah. I mean, I I think. I think what would have to happen is it would probably have to be a tailor made PlayStation version that is only Microsoft published games, you know, and that way Sony wouldn't say like, well, you have whatever Far Cry five in here and. That sucks for us because Far Cry 5 is for sale for $30 on our store. But we can't buy Halo. In other words, it would be like a service where it's like it o- you can only play them through Game Pass. And I would argue like even have compelling reasons within Game Pass's service on another console to say like, well, it's a little more open and easier and you can get your achievements and all that. Like, I think I think that's what Microsoft wants. I, I think they want it for obvious reasons. And I think Sony doesn't for their own obvious reasons. But I will say if Sony doesn't have their their selves or themselves organized over the next two years or so in terms of their internal development and what they plan on releasing from both first and second party and Microsoft gets their ducks in order, um, you're going to see the outcome and it's not going to be pretty from, from PlayStation. But I don't know that I have the confidence in that. You have to have world class production resources to to line all of those studios up in such a way that is coherent. And uh, I would love to do that. I mean, that would be a fucking awesome job to do, you know, to really try to figure out and manage that catalog. But it's going to be a big lift. But I think Sony is very much in a disadvantage right now. Yeah, Um, I think I'm in agreement. I think Microsoft is making so many interesting moves that you can't help but pay attention to them and respect it. Again, the only thing I don't respect about what they're doing is just how they have to speak in code. 
And I find that obnoxious. I find that obnoxious in politics. I find that obnoxious in entertainment. And I find it obnoxious in our industry, too. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. But in the meantime, I would work under the assumption that you will not be receiving any of these games on PlayStation. And I'm sorry I was wrong, but that's the way it goes. I've been way more catastrophically wrong than this. So and again, I'm always right. So when I'm wrong, you have every right to take it out on me. But try to keep it within the, the I put a Twitter post up. All of the abuse should go to that Twitter post. Let's not spread it around, you know, right. abuse me in that post. Now, and the thing is, Colin, I know a lot of people like to bring up your your Vita article on mm-hmm. IGN. Yeah, the Vita has long outlived the 3DS, though, at this point. So they bring maybe up a, yeah, they bring up a few things, right? They bring up that piece because for people that don't know what IGN, I wrote a piece predicting that Vita would outsell 3DS. This was before both consoles came out or both handles right. came out. Um, and they point to that. They point to like my Mass Effect 3 stuff. They point to a video in which I said I was worried about Switch's performance and all of that. But I'm like, guys, like, first of all, I love that you're going back and reading my old stuff. I live in your head. So that's pretty awesome. The second thing <laughs> right. is, is that um, I my job as a commentator is to commentate and I cannot possibly be right all the time. There's no way. The only thing I want people to walk away from with these kinds of things is not the right or wrong of it. It's to say, was the approach logical, you know, and you can never come to this particular argument, I don't think, about the way we kind of framed Bethesda in, in the last weeks and months and think that it was illogical. I would argue, again, that it's still more logical than what they seem to be doing. But I'm not Microsoft. And again, I own a lot of Microsoft stock, so... I'm wishing them the very best. Believe me. I'm a man, so not to be too cliche, but I don't really care about my skin. I mean, I wash it, it's clean, but there's definitely more I could be and should be doing, which is why I was so intrigued when Curology walked into my life. Curology makes skincare effortless, even for those of us not putting a whole lot of effort into the ordeal to begin with. By creating custom formulas that are tailor-made for your skin, Curology can help with everything from general cleanliness and maintenance to more serious skincare issues like acne or dark spots. By going to Curology.com sacred, that's C-U-R-O-L-O-G-Y dot com slash S-A-C-R-E-D, you can begin your skincare journey by answering a series of questions that are designed to help determine which course or courses of action are right for you. When I signed up, I told Curology's dermatology providers the basics, my skin type, what I'm looking to achieve, and all the rest. I found it simple, straightforward, and not overwhelming at all, which is great because I'm totally clueless in this arena. From there, Curology took care of the rest, and days later, I received both some soap and lotion to add to my daily routine. What I think I like most about Curology, though, is that they check in with you. There aren't any assumptions made about what's working or not. You get to tell them directly, and if modifications are necessary, they'll be made. I also like how low pressure it is. If you forget to use it or aren't quite as rigorous with your routine as you should be, it's all good. They'll still check in and calibrate everything according to your behavior, too. And if you go to Curology.com slash sacred, you can get a 30 day free trial of their products so you can see what Curology can do for you. All you have to do is cover a small shipping and handling fee of five bucks. So if you're ready for healthier skin and a routine that makes sense, go to Curology.com slash sacred to get started. Get your 30 day free trial of Curology skincare products by going to Curology.com slash sacred. You just cover shipping and handling. That's Curology.com slash sacred. You had mentioned this earlier, Dustin, number two, PlayStation 5 sales. The MPD Group has released new sales data, this time for the month of February 2021, chronicling sales on the world's largest video game market, the United States. For starters, when counting for unadjusted dollar sales, PlayStation 5 is now America's fastest selling video game console of all time after four months. Overall, game spending is up 35% year over year as we move into the new generation. Hardware sales are up well over 100% and more. When it comes to software, the month's top five best-selling games were in order and across platforms. Super Mario 3D World, Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War, Persona 5 Strikers, Miles Morales, and Madden NFL 21. Other notable games include Little Nightmares 2 at 6, which is unbelievable, Assassin's Creed Valhalla at 7, FIFA 21 at 11, Mortal Kombat 11 at 14, and Immortals Phoenix Rising at 20. When only counting games sold on PS4 and PS5, the top 10 best-selling games of the month were in order. Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War, Miles Morales, Persona 5 Strikers, Madden NFL 21, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Minecraft, NBA 2K21, FIFA 21, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, and Little Nightmares 2. 2021's best-selling games across platforms so far are in order. Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War, Super Mario 3D World, Miles Morales, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, 
Madden NFL 21, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, Animal Crossing New Horizons, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, Persona 5 Strikers, and Ring Fit Adventure. When including the last 12 calendar months, you'll find three PlayStation exclusives, The Last of Us 2, Ghost of Tsushima, and Miles Morales in the top 10. Timothy Bryant wrote into us on Patreon and said, hey, Coca-Cola, Colin, and Cordyceps, Chris, he ain't here. How you both are fucking that chicken vigorously. We always do. Wow. If the supply constraints for the PS5 continue like it's going to for the foreseeable future, do you believe that Sony will be forced to have their 2022 exclusives come to the PS4 as well as the PS5 just to make sure they don't anger fans? Do you guys think they can get away with having a state of pl- state of play in, say, September, bringing all PS5 games while there are many people that um, September being all PS5 games while there are many people who still can't get their hands on one? Curious to know your guys' opinion. If they can't rectify the situation for a long time, have a great day, fellas. So first of all, PlayStation 5 selling huge. We don't know specific numbers sold because they won't say. Um, it's worth noting that the MPD numbers are based on monies made at a $500 console compared to a $400 PS4 unadjusted. It's unclear if, if they would have outsold at that number. So we're missing some data, but it seems very promising. I tweeted out a pretty open question, which was what would sales look like untethered from supply constraints? In other words, if everyone that wanted one can get one, then what would those sales look like? Unknowable, but interesting to think about. I do have to nip this in the bud, though, from Timothy and others. Sony is eventually not going to have to care about who has a PS4. They care too much already. And I really have a problem with this suddenly new mode of thinking that because people don't have a new console, games can't go to it. You know, it's it's like a totally new argument. I've never I've been in this industry for over 20 years. Never heard that. Never heard that argument until these last few months. So we know Horizon's going to PS4. I really think that's where it stops. Uh, I don't know that we're going to get much more than that. I understand the mentality of tapping into that old player base. But and I'm worried about God of War being cross gen, which I think would suck. But. I just don't know that we ever had a different generation, Dustin, where people were so worried about holding games back because they can't find a console. It seemed I'm not saying Timothy is saying it like this, but a lot of people do say it in a very selfish way. And it's like, dude, we're not all going to wait. It's not reasonable. Why do we have the console now then? And that's why I keep saying I don't think there's really much reason to even own a PS5 right now. What do you think about the sales success and what Timothy said here about PS4 and all the rest? Yeah, the argument about because we got into this when we were talking about how Resident Evil said, oh, Resident Evil 8 is coming to current gen. I'm like, no, it's coming to last gen because PS5 is here now. PS5 is now current gen. And so people argued with me about this. And somebody again, I'm sorry, I can't remember who said this. This was months ago, but they were like, the only console I have is a Commodore 64. Therefore, it's current gen. Because there's a lot of people arguing like, well, most people have PS4, so that's the current gen. I'm like, no, that's that's not how that works. But I think you're right in the fact that Sony has to give it up at some point. And especially now we're looking at these sales number, the fastest selling console uh, in the U.S. So I I don't know how long they are going to stretch this out because you got to wonder that as more and more people get PS5, then the 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 scales start to shift when when way less people had PS5 then you were angering more people that couldn't get one but as more people get PS5 you start to anger those PS5 owners that aren't getting exclusive games now there's many arguments that well they're still getting a PS5 game it's just coming to PS4 also so they really shouldn't be mad or who cares because they already bought the PS5. Like maybe Sony doesn't really care about upsetting those people because they're going to buy the PS5 version anyway. So I don't know. I wouldn't expect them to do this into 2022. I think that would be a very unwise decision and something that would also maybe potentially frustrate uh, a lot of their teams that maybe then, you know, you have to imagine there's already quite a few games for exclusively on PS5 that are in development for 2022. And for them to come in now and be like, well, we can't get enough consoles out. We need you to make a PS4 version, right? Like, 
I don't know. It seems like you're, you're kind of losing the point then at that point, like at some point you got to make the cutoff. And, and like, like we said, it's the fastest selling console ever. There are more, tell me if this is accurate because this is what I'm gathering from this. There are more PS fives out in consumers hands than there were PS fours at this point. If you take from launch day to now, is that right? Again, we don't know because the the numbers were different. So true. Like the four, one was 400, one was 500. That seems to indicate to me that they're probably comparable because I feel like otherwise they would have just said that outright. Right. Sony still hasn't confirmed how many they've sold, which is weird. I, I still don't understand that at all, but it's on. It's on. Un, I'm uncertain about it, but. It is weird. This this generation is the first generation ever where people are actively complaining and trying to hold games back for because they can't get a new console as if new consoles are easy to find ever. Does no one remember the Wii? I mean, I don't know how many times I have to say this. The Wii was worse than this. Worse. So bad. I remember, dude. And the PS2 was pretty bad, too. So this isn't new. And at that time, as I said, with the Wii example, I wasn't I didn't get a Wii until 2007. And I wasn't being like, are you that Super Mario Galaxy game better not fucking come out on Wii. It better be on GameCube because I only have a GameCube. It's like, no, sorry, like. That's not the way it works. And I, I do think that it's going to start to annoy PS5 gamers when they're like, it's first of all, it's not as trivial as people think, even on x86 architecture to just port games and all that. You make games for consoles. Then you if you focus on one console, the game is going to be more refined for that one console. It's just the way it is. I mean, it's just it's just the way development works. And I feel like we're doing ourselves a disservice as an ecosystem to want games to be held back. I was really the Resident Evil news was a bummer, but I was really bummed out by the Horizon news. Um, I was really bummed out by that. I was like, that sucks. You know, why would you do this? Because then it started opening the door to this happening for others. And I think Horizon is a specific example, because as I've reported in the past, Horizon began as a PS4 game. So Horizon 2 began development as a PS4 game. So I think it was more logical for them to, to port it from to port it forwards, which is, I think, what they did. God of War remains to be seen what what it natively is on. So I just implore people to kind of buck that mentality because I think it does the new generation a great disservice. And it's just not the way that the video game industry has ever functioned. The scarcity of the PS5 is not unprecedented and you're just going to have to wait a little while. And I keep saying that the good news for those who can't find the console is frustrated as you are. And I get it. You're not missing anything. And you're going to be missing even less if they keep releasing games on PS4, then you're going to have to wonder why you're even going to buy a PS5. We want PS5 for PS5 games, and I'm sick of playing PS4 games on it already. So I can only imagine how I'll feel next year if I'm going to still right. be playing these games. Colin, do you think that some of this, the way this conversation is going is based mm -hmm. on. To me, uh, Twitter and the online way that we communicate is already so different from even at the launch of the the ps4 do you i wonder if some of this decision making would be based off of the fact that they're they're seeing the the loud but maybe not representative of the whole people complaining online yeah i think there's something to be said about that i also think that maybe they're sensitive to the economic realities of the last year i think they want to be friendly with their new expensive console and not force people out in that regard. I think there's a lot of different things that they're trying to balance and I get it from an optical standpoint, a marketing standpoint, but may, there's nothing to lose. I don't think by making your console more and more enticing, even if people can't find it because when they do find it, they'll just have a greater catalog of games to play on it. And I think an interesting thing to note here, which we were surprised about based on, early information out of Japan last year is that PS5 is being sold at a loss. We didn't really know that. And that was actually only said in passing, I think from Jim Ryan in one source a couple weeks ago. And so there's an extra urgency for them to sell games on PS5 so they can make their money back on the console. They might only need to sell a few, but there's that too, because we thought that they were going to make it safely at maybe a 50 or $25 profit. And that has not been the case, especially because of the, the challenges with COVID. So We'll keep tracking it, but uh, congratulations to Sony on on fantastic PS5 numbers. And again, I would just wonder what those numbers would look like untethered 
from the very real economic force of supply constraint. But hopefully it alleviates itself soon, although I don't think it's going to this year. I think I think you're going to have a hard time finding a PS5. I, I think everyone I think if you're persistent, you'll find one this year. But I don't think you're going to walk into a store and see one. I think you're just going to have to hit it right. You know, oh, all right. Number three, a new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game has been announced and it's clearly attempting to capture the spirit of TMNT's most popular games, the late 80s and early 90s co-op arcade brawlers. The game in question is called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge. And while it's only been announced vaguely for consoles, it's presumed it'll be on both PS4 and PS5. The developer behind Shredder's Revenge is Tribute Games, the talented Canadian studio most recently behind 2020's Panzer Paladin, which is yet to come to PlayStation platforms, though their 2014 side-scrolling shooter Mercenary Kings, which came to uh, came to both PS4 and Vita, and they had other games like Flint Hook and Ninja Senki, which will be a fail, uh, familiar to PS4 and PS Vita gamers as well. French publisher Dotemu is working in conjunction with Tribute to bring the game to market, which makes some sense as they recently found its way into the publishing of some other old school games in recent years, including the notab- uh, most notably 2020's fantastic Streets of Rage 4. TMNT hit Western televisions in the late 80s following an obscure run of graphic novels. By the time 1989 rolled around when we were swimming in toys and all of that, we got Konami's beloved arcade brawler that later came to NES in late 1990 in the form of TMNT 2, one of NES's best-selling games. It was followed by multiple sequels and reimaginings over the years, though it's been well over a decade since the series has been revisited in this fashion. What do you think? Are you a fan of the old? Uh, you're a little young for them, but I'm wondering if you remember those or played them or had any had any connection to those very classic four player co-op arcade turtle games. Yes, I am extremely excited about this because in one of my um, earliest gaming memories was playing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Hyperstone Heist for the Sega Genesis and specifically my memory is that so my mom had me at a, a very young age and so my uncle is just four years older than me so a lot of growing up he was sort of like a brother to me in a lot of ways and so i remember like hanging out in the basement of my grandparents house drinking giant eagle brand cream soda eating pizza and playing teenage ninja turtles hyperstone heist this is like a a cherished highly cherished memory and so this trailer was just all the right pieces are in place like we have a studio uh, with Tribute Games who has history working on Scott Pilgrim, uh, which was a fantastic brawler. We have uh, Dot Emu, which they just did um, Streets of Rage. And so, and dude, I was so happy when I saw the trailer and they did the pixel art, right? Which yes. I think Streets of Rage 4 looks great. They did a fantastic job, but I would have liked it more if it was pixels. So to see them do this in a way that it's clear that there's a lot of love and adoration for those classic Konami games is just perfect. Yeah, I totally agree. This is this is where TMNT belongs. Yes, it always because of the four turtles. It always just made a lot of sense in co-op. It it was amongst those other games that we used to play in the arcade, like the Simpsons and the X-Men game uh, co-op games. But for some reason, this one always just stuck to the top. And because it got such a really faithful and well done port on NES, I mean, it's it's not as good as the arcade version, but it allowed us to play it at home. It was such, I mean, it was such a huge that game was huge when I was in elementary school. And I always feel like every game that's a TMNT game that doesn't I'm not saying there's no room for other kinds of TMNT games, but any game like when when I think Platinum did that TMNT game some years ago and others, it's like you have to kind of just go back to this and reform TMNT as an established game franchise here, because this is the way people most associate with them in gaming. And I think that that's really exciting. So I was really excited about this too. Uh, Jason Bola wrote in about a good point. He says, look, everyone is excited about the TMNT game. It looks great. But how about Mike Patton singing the old, the old cartoons theme song with some changes, always excited to see his collaboration in games. Would love to see more of him uh, again since the darkness is dead. The darkness, of course, was Mike Patton's last foray in the games. And I Mike Patton, of course, is the lead singer of Faith No More and Mr. Bungle. Yeah, that was I'm a huge Faith No More fan, as I think the audience knows. So that was a cool little touch 
as well. And it was kind of, I think a very smart thing, because if you go and look at Pitchfork and other music media, there's been a lot of pickups of this game in that vertical of entertainment because of this, which I think was a very clever thing for them to do. Um, and then Billy Deadman wrote into us with the, you know, the logical question. He says, Calabunga last stand, dudes, which turtle are you all picking in Shredder's Revenge? I'm taking dibs on Mikey. Oh. Who do you gravitate towards? Who's your turtle? Leo. For yeah, me sure. Too. Yeah, definitely. Because I love, I mean, blue and then the the, the dual katanas, of yeah, course. I mean, doesn't get any better. I mean, that is so... Dagan and I were just talking about that, actually, like the, the, the late 80s, early 90s katana obsession. Yeah. Was really encapsulated in, in Leo. I always loved Leo. Donatello is my second favorite. Um, in the mo- in the 1990 movie, I love Raphael the best. But Raphael and Mikey don't have a lot of range with their weapons. So I don't know how it's going to play out in this one, but I always kind of stayed away from them. I remember Mikey being useful, I think, in the original arcade game. But uh, uh, it's been a while since I played it. But I'm definitely going to gravitate towards Leo. I mean, he's he's my guy. He's definitely my guy. All right. Number four. A few weeks ago. As we discussed, uh, we discussed the exciting news that publisher Electronic Arts was finally going to revisit its once popular and since abandoned NCAA football franchise, which has been dormant since 2013. We even learned that EA was gearing up to work with hundreds of schools on official iconography, stadiums and more, really bringing realism back to a game that struggled to manage the NCAA's rules against athlete likenesses, profit and more. However, thanks to some eagle eyed reporting on website GameSpot, we now know that EA is unlikely to release the next NCAA football game until at least 2023. While we knew we'd be waiting for a little while, we didn't anticipate having to wait two plus years per se. GameSpot found information from journalist Mike Brown in which EA Sports told the collegiate licensing company that the game would launch in July of 2023. This is because, as Brown notes, the game doesn't only need to be made from the ground up, but they need to work on all of the little things that could conceivably be then carried over in their future games. Everything from logos and stadiums and uniforms to mascots and school bands and all the rest. NCAA Football 14, the last NCAA game, uh, football game uh, launched on PS3, July 9th, 2013. So it seems like they're going to maybe try to aim for the 10 year anniversary, which is smart. It was interesting to read. I know this is not a, a, a topic for you because you're not a huge sports guy, but this is a really fascinating topic to read about because they really do have to manage so much because when you're making an NHL game or an NFL game, you really are dealing with two entities. You're dealing with like the NFL and the NFL PA or the MLB and the MLB PA or the NHL and the NHL PA. And that represents everything, the players and the teams. But here where there are no uniform rules in college football, really, you have to deal with all the different conferences and all the different teams, and they all want to do different things with their players, and they have different traditions and songs and bands. And it's like, I can only imagine that it's actually quite nightmarish. But once they get that out, then they can replicate it every year. So just wanted to throw that out there. We're not going to get the NCAA football game for probably two more seasons. I wanted to ask you about this next one, though, Dustin. Sure. See if it's something you're interested in. Number five. It looks like Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne HD Remaster is readying for its Western release, something that was only tacitly acknowledged when the game was revealed for Japanese launch. It's already out in Japan, actually. Word comes by way of a leaked ESRB rating for the game, which confirms it's been submitted for American launch on PlayStation 4. However, no future, uh, no further details, I'm sorry, on timing have yet been revealed. The Atlas developed and published game originally came to PS2 in Japan in 2003 and in the West in 2004, where it garnered a niche but hardcore audience. The series itself spans back to 1987, when the original Megami Tensei game called Digital Devil Story came to Famicom and elsewhere in Japan, and its 1992 sequel was only launched on Super Famicom in Japan. It wasn't until this game that we got it, the series in the West, so, so there is some significance with this release. Every Shin Megami Tensei game since that point, however, was launched on either Nintendo DS or 3DS, and some were never published in the West at all. Shin Megami Tensei 4 came to 3DS in 2016, and Shin Megami Tensei 5 is slated for launch only on Switch later this year. So this is a little weird. Shin Megami Tensei 3 did come to PS2 in 2004. Some people played it. It actually apparently sold pretty well in the West. But the series has since migrated to 3DS, The newest one, 5, is not coming to PS4. This one is coming to PS4 and Switch. And I think it actually looks pretty good. It's traditional and and, and delightfully old school, I like. Kind of looks a little bit like Wild Arms 3 when I was looking at footage of it, but I think I might play this game. I heard it was catastrophically broken in Japan, though, and I'm wondering if they'll be able to fix it here. I'm sure that they will. Is this a game interesting to you at all as a weeb? Yeah, well, I'm interested in it just as a 
a Persona fan just because it's Persona comes from Shin Megami Tensei. In fact, up until Persona 4, it was Shin Megami Tensei Persona. And it wasn't until, I believe, Persona 4 Golden was the first one where they dropped the Shin Megami Tensei name. And then Persona 5, it was nowhere to be found either. So this is a bit of a dark spot for me in that I have such an association with its sister series. And I'm I'm curious to check it out to see where that DNA intersects. So the thing for me has always been that it's never been available in a current platform. And it's one of those things where I could go back and either play a 3DS or pull out some old hardware, but I just don't I don't want to do that. So I'm I'm glad that this is coming to somewhere where it'll be accessible. Yeah, Shin Megami Tensei apparently means rebirth of the god. So that makes sense. I don't know. Um, yeah, I guess they split it up at some point. But I think you're right because I think I have Persona 4 on PS2, and I think I have it un- unopened. It was the last PS2 game I got, and I think it was. Uh, I think it does say Shin Megami Tensei on there. Let's see, Persona 4 Golden. I keep my copy close at all times. Yeah, I see that. No Shin Megami Tensei on the front, just P4G. Only on PlayStation. Not anymore. Nope, not anymore, which is a good thing. Yeah, so, I agree. I mean, why? Yeah. <laughs> especially it's like, why would you? It's really pretty, pretty cruel to lock it on Vita, you know? Right. Number six, publisher Electronic Arts has revealed an all new deal through its EA Originals label. This one with the British studio Silver Rain for a new unannounced IP. No further details were given. Increasingly growing British publisher Sumo Group is launching a new publishing arm called Secret Mode. I love that name. That will work on publishing both its internal games and some independent outside games as well. Sumo Group's Sumo Digital is already one of the UK's biggest games industry employers at over 1,000 heads. Embracer owned publisher THQ Nordic has revealed that its own it, that it, it owns an all new studio. This one located in Spain and called Alchemia Interactive. They're hard at work on the Gothic remake that was briefly announced last year. Gothic being a PC only action RPG from 2001. The remake will come to console. Sadly, however, we also have word of a studio closure. V1 Interactive, the five-year-old studio responsible for last year's FPS Disintegration, has officially shut down. Published by 2K-owned label Private Division, Disintegration didn't prove to be a success, and you'll recall that its entire multiplayer mode was disabled only months after launch. About 30 people have been affected. So just some business news there. I want to focus specifically in on this, um, this Disintegration move. I don't know what the problem with that game was uh, apart from a crowded ecosystem of like-minded games, but I couldn't get away from how bad that name was. I feel like that really had a lot of like, disintegration. That's the, it's just, it's not good enough. You know, it's, it, it, I know that it seems weird, but you have to have a name that grabs attention. I can't really think of many big games today that don't have either a meaningful moniker like call of duty or an interesting name that brings you in like apex legends fortnite i just don't know that disintegration is that but that's just a, a minor quabble what do, what do you think about this i can tell you what's wrong with the game i mean you, you're first of all the, the name you're right is not good but the game also just wasn't very fun <laughs> so i played this game when it was in beta for uh handsome phantom my the site that i work with and it was not very good in the beta, which, you know, sometimes games can get a lot better. But as we've talked about, beta nowadays is mainly a network test slash demo. And uh, looking at the game now on Steam, it is still uh, it has 147 reviews and it is considered mixed. And I'm not surprised by that just because my time with it was uh, not very good. I mean, it's it was a unique idea in that I believe you're like you're riding around on vehicles and then you're on foot. So they add some interesting aspects. There's like an RTS element to it, isn't there? <clears throat> like, wasn't there like a strategy, some sort of weird strategy element to it? And that's what they shut off, I think. So there was some, something, yeah, it was something weird. Um, It kind of reminded me a little bit of Dust 514 where it was. But it was just like one element of like Dust 514 was such a great idea that never came to fruition. And I like shooters that are also trying to do something else. But it is interesting. This wasn't a fly by night game. I mean, 2K published it. It, it is interesting that they um, they picked a loser. Yeah. But 
we wish everyone the best. And as far as all the other acquisitions, just some random news. We don't really know anything about Silver Rain, the studio. Sumo Group is just growing exponentially. And of course, Alchemia Interactive has existed working on Gothic. We just didn't have a name for them yet. So just some business news. And then finally, Dustin, number seven is a wrap up. The official PlayStation blog confirms Obsidian RPG, The Outer Worlds, now Microsoft Studio, is getting its second and final piece of DLC in the form of Murder of, uh, of Eridanos or Murder on Eridanus, which launches on PS4 on March 17th. So you might it might actually be out for you by the time you hear this. The site also revealed the co-op puzzle game We Were Here Forever, which comes to PS5 at an undetermined date in the future. Website GameSpot confirms the popular survival game Rust is finally getting its long awaited PlayStation 4 launch sometime this spring. Man, that game has been in development for PS4 wow. forever. <laughs> Website Push Square reports walking simulator Paradise Lost is coming to PS4 on March 24th and puzzle platformer Lost Words Beyond the Page is coming to PS4 on April 6th. That game Parasite, uh, Paradise Lost is cool. It's um, or it looks cool. Is it based on the it, book? No, it's uh, it's uh, John, isn't that John Milton? The, yeah. No, this is based on it's a walking simulator, which is cool, but it takes place in Europe when World War Two takes several more decades to finish. Oh, um, and so I'm really interested in that because I'm so sick of all of future history and alternate history stuff. But in walking simulators, that's kind of cool. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to check interesting. I'm looking at it right now and it looks really cool. Yeah. The website also reports that stealth game Aragami 2 has been delayed until the third quarter of this year on both PS4 and PS5. Website Gamatsu reports horror game Dark Complete Edition comes to PlayStation 4 on March 25th. Futuristic Racer Super Impossible Road is coming to PS4 and PS5 later this year. And action RPG Black Witchcraft, which will come to PS4 at a yet unrevealed time. Publisher Bandai Namco has revealed that its Tarsier Studios developed horror game Little Nightmares 2 has surpassed 1 million units sold following its launch last month. I had no idea that th- those games were so big. The Little Nightmare games. Me neither. The, the, as we mentioned a couple weeks ago, the first one has sold 3 million units. Developer Gearbox revealed that its upcoming Borderlands 3 Director's Cut DLC has been delayed due to Texas's recent blizzard conditions and will now launch on April 8th. And finally, publisher Atlas has provided us with updated sales numbers on VanillaWare's unique action adventure game 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim, which has now sold 400,000 copies. It was just a few weeks ago. It was at 300,000. So it seems to be finding its way yeah. into the market. I saw the I mean, I only played it for a few minutes. I really liked it, but it, I, I was in a weird state, state of mind, I think. Got to really pay attention. All right, Dustin, as we often do or always do, tradition dictates on sacred symbols. We end with six questions, comments, concerns, thoughts and ideas from the audience over on Patreon at patreon.com slash last stand media. This allows us to touch on a few items as we close out our wonderful show. And we'll start with Ian Savage, who says, hey, CC boys, and hopefully that big, big D. He's here. It's your boy. My three year old son has recently expressed more interest in video games, but lacks the dexterity and understanding to truly play them. And it got me thinking, what is the earliest memory you guys have of games and what would you recommend for a true first PlayStation experience to a budding young mind? Thanks for keeping podcasts great. I got to say, I mean, so I have very early memories of playing NES. I have memories of playing Kid Icarus and Kung Fu and Mario 2 and all that stuff. So probably from 87, 88 are my earliest gaming memories. And that's what came to mind for me, Dustin, is that I don't know that PlayStation is a great place for a three year old to play. Um, Sony might not like me saying that, but I'm thinking, Ian, go get an NES classic and hack it and put a bunch of ROMs on it and let your son hold an NES controller, two buttons, a D pad, very simple, very small for his hands. I think that's part of the reason why NES was so attractive to young kids was because we could really play it. It's hard for me to imagine a three year old holding a dual sense controller. So I my opinion is don't let him well, let him play PlayStation. It doesn't matter. But I really think he should be playing. Go let him play the classics and wrap his mind around Mario. Let him wrap his mind around Zelda. Let him wrap his mind around all that stuff. Maybe work him up to an SNES classic where he can start getting into other things like Mario Kart. And then I think he'll when, when, when his mind starts wrapping his mind around those kinds of things, then then you move him on the PlayStation, at which point maybe he's a little older. He can hold the controller a little more comfortably. I don't know that PS5 is made or PS4 is made for three year olds, even if you go towards the games that are that are for younger audiences. What, what do you think, Dustin? Yeah, I've I've thought about this a lot because there's a lot of people that talk about, you know, when I have kids, I'm going to start them at the beginning of gaming and work their their way up and I the Dagan Moriarty method as we like to call it right yeah. which it's funny because I actually kind of had that experience in that 
my first console was a Sega Genesis, and there's like a picture of me in a diaper playing Sonic. Um, and then what's no what's wonder. odd is yeah, I this would have been later in the 90s. My my parents, this was a period when we weren't very wealthy at all. Um, not that we were like dirt poor, but it was interesting because my parents got me an NES after the Genesis because that was what was cheapest at the time. They wanted to get me something cool and new, but um, the NES was like the, you know, the stuff that people were getting rid of at that time. So it's just ironic to think back that like the collection they gave me, which included like, all the Mario games, Marble Madness, you know, stuff like a really good lineup now would have been like hundreds of dollars probably. But I I'm appreciative of that because even though I'm not a child of the 80s, I feel like I have that experience and it's very important to me as someone who cares so deeply about games and have revolved my entire life around games. And so you obviously don't want to push your kid into something they don't like but i think that it's totally appropriate to lay out the stepping stones in order for them to get that classical gaming education we'll say yeah i I totally agree i totally agree with you i i don't know that it's necessary it's just very it's hard well i guess it's like film or something else like you you plop a kid in front of um the Godfather and he's not going to understand it. You know, you pop a kid in front of uh, the little mermaid and he's going to understand it. You're watching both of those things. It's a similar thing with gaming. I just feel like introducing simple, simpler methods, graphics, 2d side scrolling for the most part. It's just a, it's a better way. I think to train a child into what games are. And it's almost like the an interesting thing too, where you almost don't want to show him the shiniest new stuff because then he might not, he might be incapable of appreciating in some way the older stuff that's neither here nor there because it doesn't really matter to me i mean what you what you do with your kid i just think that he's young enough where you have a chance to build him fundamentally um it's not to say you want to make him a gamer in your image it's just like he has the opportunity to not know any better right like if you put an nes controller in his hand he's not any the wiser that it's a fucking 30 plus year old console you know um he's just going to have fun with it and he's going to realize that this is the shit. And then he'll just be mind blown by the time he gets to the more modern, modern stuff. So that's my suggestion, Mr. Savage. Good luck to you. Luke wrote in and said, Hey, CDC with Avengers having their grind put up, uh, put up later in the game and rumors circulating. Do you guys think Avengers becoming free to play soon with the hero passes kept as the income stream as possible? Or given Sony's relationship with square Enix, have, uh, you guys have been discussing in recent episodes. Is it likely to be on a PlayStation Plus games list later this year? Keep up the good work. So there's a lot of drama around the Avengers this past week. Dustin, have you been keeping up with it at all? I saw some of it as far as I believe you already that Luke spelled it out here that they made it a lot more grindy, which is yeah, just which weird. Is, a game. Yeah, I don't understand that. I never, does that ha- something that happens in games as a service? It seems like you would do the opposite. You know? Right. I mean, it's always difficult, especially this is a big thing with Destiny in that you want to give the players who play every day something to do and something that's worthwhile. Uh, but you also don't want your more casual fans to, um, you know, be overwhelmed by the amount of things. So but I mean, Avengers is is not in the position that Destiny is and that they are losing players, I'm sure, r- regularly. So. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's. I don't know what Square is going to do with this game. I feel like here's the unfortunate reality for them is that they made most of their money like all games do at the very beginning, and they still lost 70 million dollars. So keeping this thing alive is going to cost them more money. The opportunity cost, which we always talk about on the show, is also present. If Crystal is working on this, they can't be working on something else. It's not to say that there's multiple teams, but certainly resources should be going towards what Crystal does best, which is single player games. And so I don't know what Square Enix's plan is with this. It would be interesting to make it a PS Plus game. I know that they still have characters they want to release. I know that they're going to continue to try. But I'll keep a close eye on Square Enix's financials moving forward because I wonder if they'll I wonder if that number will shorten, stay the same or grow. And even if it shortens to something more, a loss more acceptable, the game's never going to be profitable. And so it really makes you wonder what the point is is all at all. And it's what we were saying with Anthem and EA, I think, Dustin, which is 
Square Enix can't really burn people because that people will remember. And when you put a game out like this, that's the risk is that you kind of have to support it, even if no one's playing it. I mean, look at how long Anthem just limped on for two plus years until they shut it down, you know, or st- they didn't shut it down. They just stopped. They were like, we, we are not going to fix it after all. So, right. I, yeah. I think the end game is definitely free to play for sure. I think that there's probably value that they can still extract by selling it to Sony for PlayStation Plus and maybe even to Microsoft for for Game Pass. Um, it's just figuring out what the the timeline for that is. Wet Willie wrote into us, said, hey, Sacred Symbols crew. I was perusing my PlayStation 3 collection the other day and the game L.A. Noir got me thinking, why aren't there more detective games in the vein of L.A. Noir? It was a bit ahead of its time with facial recognition, and I can't help but think the power of the PS5 and new Xbox would greatly enhance a game of this type. Murder documentaries are an extremely popular genre on streaming services, and it seems as though there is an opportunity for a series here. Game devs could even scan through the thousands of murders in human history and use them for inspiration for the stories. Thanks, and here's to feeling good all the time. So I agree with you there, 100% feeling good all the time. But L.A. Noir, when it came out, that's, of course, a, a, a rock star published game, has a really interesting backstory to it in terms of the difficulty in making it, the studio that made it. Uh, an Australian team, what were they called? Bondi and and all the rest. A lot of interesting s- stuff behind them. Also very long in development. But I remember playing L.A. Noir and not really liking it very much. I know a lot of people do. I also think there's a lot of revision about L.A. Noir over the last 10 years or so where people have come around to it. But I was going to say, Dustin, I feel like detective games do exist. I just feel like you're looking in the wrong genre. If you want this stuff, Wet Willie, and you're willing to play something that's a little more static, you want to go towards visual novels. I mean, that's where this shit goes down. I mean, games like Danganronpa and are, are murder mystery games. Um, games like Phoenix Wright are murder mystery games, stuff like that. So go look into those games. I mean, if you're looking for something, I know a little more third, third uh, person action oriented, maybe a little more beautiful, a little more triple A. Yeah, there, you're not going to find those. But if you're looking for murder mysteries, they're everywhere. You have to just go and play, frankly, the more weeby visual novel stuff. What do you think, Dustin? Yeah, and there's a lot of stuff that isn't weeby also, but like you said, it's not necessarily that same AAA Rockstar-esque game. Um, Specifically, one that I can recommend, I never finished it, but Return of the Obra Dinn is a really interesting detective game that takes place on a ship with a really unique art direction, but I mean, there's there's a lot of other stuff. There's the the Sherlock Holmes series. Sure. Which I cannot vouch for whether they're good or bad. I just know that they exist. Uh, recently, we've talked about it on the show, but it does fit the criteria. Disco Elysium is a murder mystery. So, and then even um, there's an indie game, Paradise Killer, which I haven't played yet. I'd like to. That's supposed to be a lot like Danganronpa. So, a lot of options, but. Uh, yeah, you're going to have to look outside of the AAA space. Yeah. And, and as far as you're right, and as far as like there are, are there some walking simulators that you might like, like the vanishing of Ethan Carter. Right. Is one of them. Um, and even the second party early PS4 game, um, Everybody's Gone to the Rapture might be another game that you want to look into. That's a little more AAA. That's from the Chinese room. So you have some options. So go look around. But man, play Danganronpa. If you haven't played Danganronpa, I mean, that's the great murder mystery that I've ever played in games. So Joel Hernandez wrote into us and said, Hey boys, CC boys and funny man, Dustin. I was, I worry that single player games will soon be dying. The future is looking like multiplayer Armageddon as a dad. My daughter and her friends only play Roblox, Fortnite and Minecraft. It's rough. I know it's a small sample, but even talking to other parents, it seems those are games that the kids are enjoying. Please tell me I'm wrong. And there will be single player games in the future. Keep up the awesome work. I think Joel is worrying for no reason here, although I understand why he is worried because what he's seeing anecdotally in his own life, single player games are alive and well, and and you're in the right ecosystem for them as long as you take Sony at their word. And maybe you do, maybe you don't, maybe you don't, but that they're going to be dumping most of the resources into continuing their trend of single player game, triple A games. So single player is, is vibrant and strong. I also think it's where risk averse money is starting to go, because as we were just saying, When you have a game like Disintegration or whatever, and you have to support it, then that costs money on the back end. Or like we were saying with the Avengers, these games cost more money to make, more money to test, more money to sustain, and more money to support. 
And I think people are looking at single player games now as like, this is what a lot of people want to play. You're not going to sell 25 million copies of your single player game, but it's a safe game to make. People want to play single player games and the multiplayer games that people play. Like he had said, like Joel said, Dustin, these are the dominant games. It's not like there is a million of them. Minecraft and Fortnite are amongst the biggest getters of those multiplayer eyeballs. So there's not a lot of competition in that space, whilst there is a lot of competition in the single player space. So it could seem upside down, but I don't think there's anything to worry about. What do you think? I think that it's it's important to consider that we're continually introducing more players and more studios into the industry. And so, yeah, you see maybe that generation of, you know, his kids or whatever that play a lot of multiplayer games. But I don't know if that means we're going to see an industry shift. I think it's just we're going to see more multiplayer games alongside of single players. There's there's more of every type of game right now. So, I yeah, I, I'm with you, Colin, in that I don't think there's any reason to be uh, concerned because there's, you know, single player games are still selling very well. We see EA, one of the biggest publishers, recognize that and remove multiplayer elements from a game that they were originally trying to shoehorn multiplayer in yep, uh, Dragon with Dragon Age. Age. So right. there's nothing to worry about. No, I, I agree. I, I think if it was 10 years ago, I can understand why you'd be concerned. Sure. Because that was when everyone was trying to well, I always use Bioshock 2 as an example, but every game had like a multiplayer component. It was unclear, like what was the most important part of the game It was very mixed up. Everyone was confused. I feel like we're, we're past that now. And so I think we're in better shape now. Sam Torstenbo wrote into us and said, hey, CCP, CCCP, like the Soviet Union, with the closing of Japan Studio, what will happen to Fumito Ueda and Team Eco? It's my understanding that Team Eco was nested in Japan Studio. Do you think there's a UA, a UEDA project that works or was The Last Guardian such a failure that Sony isn't willing to give them another chance? I quite enjoyed The Last Guardian, Shadow of the Colossus and Eco, and would be quite sad if UEDA went the way of Katamari creator Kaeda Takahashi and left the industry entirely. No, that's not going to happen, Sam. I'm very pleased to let you know what is going on with UEDA. So Team Eco disbanded during the the development, the long protracted development of The Last Guardian. It was finished with the help of Japan Studio by an external team led by Ueda called Gen Design, G-E-N-D-E-S-I-G-N. And Gen Design finished The Last Guardian. You'll notice that they're built on it. And that studio exists still outside of the walls of Japan Studio. So Gen Studios exists. They're working on a game and they're working on a game with Epic. So you will see a new Ueda game. It's unclear when. It's unclear on what platforms it will be on. It will clearly be an Epic Game Store exclusive, but whether or not it comes to console, we don't know. But uh, Fumito Ueda is alive and well um, at Gen Design. And as far as I understand, much of the team, uh, core team of Team Eco has gone with him. So you have nothing to worry about, Sam. Nothing to worry about at all. Dustin? I also, I have to add, I don't, I don't mean to actually Sam here, but he said that the director of uh, Katamari Demacy has left the industry. He released a game in 2019 called Watam that he was the designer on. So yeah, I'm only look this up. Movie. I actually don't know much about Kaida Takahashi. Yeah, Watam was games, uh, an Annapurna released uh, game. Movie. Oh, Watam. Yeah, I that was um I remember this game. Yeah, yeah. Annapurna. So and Sam, you're working like, on all sorts of in, improper information here, but yeah, but I did wanna I did wanna let you know. Calm your heart. Calm your soul. Ueda is making his game. Whether or not it'll take another 10 years, who knows? I, right. I'm not trying to be a dickhead. I have no idea why anyone would be excited about a Ueda game but at this point. but I liked Last Guardian. But I also did not like it, if that makes sense. It's yeah, it very sense. complicated feelings. It's how I felt about Shadow of the Colossus when I finally beat it uh, earlier this year, or last year. Quinn Solanco has the final inquiry for us, Dustin. He says, hey guys, in this era of remakes and remasters, I've got to ask... How have we not had a collection or individual releases of the SNES era Final Fantasy games? My first system was an N64, and while I've gone back and played a nice chunk of the SNES catalog to catch up over the years, I've always held off on Final Fantasy 4, 5, and 6 in hopes that they'd get trophy-enabled releases. Same goes for Final Fantasy Tactics and Chrono Trigger as well. I know 4, 5, and 6 got GBA and DS releases, but those are two or more generations ago at this point. They've released 7, 8, 9, 10, and 12 over and over, so what is Square Enix waiting for when it comes to these crown jewels? Well, 
the the shitty news here, Quinn, is that those games, a lot of those games are available, but they're available on iOS, Android, sometimes PC, and they're considered incredibly bastardized versions of the games because they redid the graphics on them. They look like shit. If you go look at Final Fantasy VI on iOS, it looks like asshole. And I don't know what the answer is as to why they're not releasing these games. And because it's like he said, right now on PS4, you can download PS4 versions of seven, eight, nine, ten, ten, two, twelve. And then on PS3, you can play 13, 13, two, 13, three, 14 is playable on PS4 and PS5 soon. So it is a weird question as to where these games are. And the answer is, is I don't know. Um, you had said that the four, five and six got GBA and DS releases. That's true. Five and six got released as a port. Super Famicom ports on D on GBA Four got a GBA port and a remake on DS, the 3D remake. Final Fantasy three, which was an NES game or a Famicom game, also got that remake. So there's a lot of different versions of these games floating around, too. And I don't know if you remember, it was just a rumor years ago I was at IGN, but there was a rumor that Square Enix was working on a box set of all the Final Fantasy games, which was believable. And I feel like they were. Um, but I don't know that they ever came to fruition or whatever. They did release a lot of those games on PS1. So if you have access to a PS2 or a PS3 that plays PS1 games, you can find Final Fantasy Anthology, Final Fantasy Chronicles, Final Fantasy Origins and play all of those games. I still say though the GBA versions of four, five and six are the best ways to play them. So um, and four also has a really good complete collection on PSP that came out in 2011. So you can check that out as well. Do you have any thoughts on this, uh, Dustin? Yeah, it's disappointing, especially when you look at like I'm looking at the screenshots from Final Fantasy six on Steam. It's awful. It's horrible. It looks real bad, which I'm, I don't know what they were thinking, because that's like one of the most beautiful pixel art games ever. Right. You know? And I just don't understand. I To my understanding, they had to go and like fix the UI like basically they just took the mobile version and then put it on Steam and left a mobile UI on the PC version, which that doesn't work. You can't just do that. So they had to go and fix it to me. Now, Colin, I know you've had conversations about how or if you'd like to see Final Fantasy VI remade. My dream is that they would take the team that does Octopath Traveler and remake Final Fantasy VI in that style and that they can stay true to the, uh, like you said, the beautiful pixel art that they did and present it in an entirely new way. Maybe add voice acting, something like that. There's there's so many different ways. Or, you know, maybe a Final Fantasy VII remake treatment would be in order. I just feel like th those things would be cool, but I feel like the reason Final Fantasy VII remake made sense was because they, they released Final Fantasy VII on PS4. I think right. before we get any remakes, we need to people need to have access to the originals. And I don't know what it's the same thing. He brought up tactics as well. It's like, I don't know what, why they won't release these games. It's like if I own these games, I'd be like, let's get them out immediately. Let's make an awesome trophy list, you know, make some extras for these. And, and they would sell. They would definitely sell. I mean, these are huge games. And so I can't help but wonder. Um, they would know that. So they must have some sort of plan. I think they read the, the feedback that they got on the iOS, Android and Steam ports of those various games when they redid them in a more flat 2D version, which is they're horrible. So four, five and six, especially four and six, although I love five as well, they're classic and it would be awesome to see those games and Final Fantasy Tactics. And like you said, Chrono Trigger um, and all the rest. And you had brought up Octopath. I think that th that team seems to be inspired by Saga Frontier and we're, we're getting Saga Frontier back soon. In a re in like a re-release, so maybe they'll. I feel like that team would ma remake those games if anything, but I don't. I don't because Saga Frontier is all about the different characters and all of that, and I feel like they're taking a lot of inspiration from that. But um, I don't know, Quinn. I don't know what the story is here. But that's all we have, Dustin, for this episode of uh, Sacred Symbols of PlayStation Podcast. It's a little shorter than we've been going recently, but there's not that much news. I mean, I can't. I can't create the news. I'm not right. that powerful, you know. Yeah. Well, the we're starting now. Let's see, we're mid-March, so we've got April and May, and then we're starting to lead into the summer E3-esque, whatever that looks like. Yeah, whatever it looks like. Plus Returnal and Ratchet come out in the next couple months, so we'll be talking about those, and yeah. and all the third-party games, Resident Evil, will come out soon. So yeah, lots of different things. So I just want to reiterate, I'll be on with Mr. Matty Plays, our Xbox expert, 
on Sacred Symbols Plus next week to talk very deeply about Bethesda. So we'll get back to that. Dustin will be back on the show, I'm sure, next week or in the coming weeks. Chris will be back. Uh, hopefully he's not ill again next week and all the rest. Do you have any closing comments before we go, Dustin? No closing comments other than just to remind people, if you're at the $5 level, you have access to our Discord. I feel like I want to plug that because some people still don't know. $5 yeah, I'm not, I'm not great. I'm not great. I'm not a great self promoter, you know? Yeah, yeah. no, it's um. there's a lot of that's the thing, Colin, is that we offer so much in our especially at the five dollar level. It's hard to include everything that you get. So that's true. That's um, true. Very good. Check that out. We already talked about merch, but yeah, check it out. Get yourself. Somebody online said that this mask looked like Antifa gear. Oh, so, cool. you know, if you want to light a trash can on fire, yell at your mom. This might be the mask to do it in. Yeah, if you're going to storm a courthouse or something, just don't wear that. No, <laughs> don't wear that. Uh, all right. Well, Dustin, thank you for your time today. Appreciate you. Uh, no problem. Thank you all out there for your time, love, support, everything you do for us. We couldn't do it without you. So uh, enjoy the show. Hope you enjoyed the show. Enjoy all the other stuff we do. And we'll see you next time for more Sacred Symbols. Until then, goodbye. See you later. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC, and is recorded from Central Virginia and Burbank, California, USA. The show is conceived by, is written by, and is produced by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-host is Chris Ragon Maldonado. Sacred Symbols executive producer is Dustin Furman, and the show is edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand Media's shows, including Sacred Symbols, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer support level or higher on Patreon, and we're grateful for your kindness and generosity. 